This is Jocko Podcast number 151 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And we haven't done a Q&A for a while, and we're going to roll into a Q&A. And normally, quite frankly, normally the Q&As, when we show up for the Q&As, there's a little bit of a different atmosphere, we'll say, right? Sure. A little bit of levity in levity, the room. Everything's sure. like, you know, hey, we're, we're not going to talk about war. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be reading about men being wounded or killed. We're not going to be reading about some atrocity and hearing what people go through. We're going to be answering questions, and there's there's a little bit more just lightheartedness to the whole thing, usually. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it goes a little bit, you know, one way or the other. But this is there's just a little bit of a different situation in the recording room right now because we just did a uh, and this is kind of surprising because mm-hmm. we just did a warrior kid podcast and in the warrior kid podcast <clears throat> I answer questions from kids for Uncle Jake and those are all you know kind of just little neat little kid questions hey are cheeseburgers good for you and mm-hmm. what do I do when I'm nervous at a jiu-jitsu tournament and what do I do when I can't Remember how to spell Mississippi, you know, just like these nice little kid <laughs> questions and they're fun mm. And yet, you know, I treat them seriously because kids have serious questions and when you're a little kid Those are real problems. Those aren't we laugh at them now. You're laughing at them. You no, know, like well the Mississippi one That's right. You're over there laughing at the kids <laughs> issues But then what I started doing a little while ago is I started telling these stories from the perspective of Uncle Jake when Uncle Jake was a kid mm. and Some of those are a little bit more they're a little bit more serious, but there's always a very big lesson to be learned because my goal with the stories from Uncle Jake is that kids can end up understanding how Uncle Jake kind of formulated his values as a man. Mm. And we've talked about a bunch of different ones of those. Uh, but anyways, the one that I did today, and, and what's interesting is all these stories are kind of based on, they're, they're based loosely around around things that I've experienced. And this is very, some of them very loosely, some of them not so loose Mm -hmm. on things that I've actually experienced, things that I went through, because I'm not Uncle Jake, but I have some similar experiences that Uncle Jake has had along the way. And anyways, today, I wanted to make the point to kids that the decisions that they make in their life are, they have a big impact, right? Mm -hmm. And if you make little decisions when you're a kid, you start making bad decisions when you're a little kid, those bad decisions eventually add up Mm -hmm. and if you make good decisions those decisions will add up and you'll in the one case you'll end up with good things if you make good decisions if you make bad decisions you'll end up in a bad situation Mm -hmm. and I told this story from Uncle Jake's perspective about Uncle Jake's best friend when he was growing up and it was a kid named Jeff and they were best friends they did everything together and they they played and they did practical jokes and they laughed and had a great time and eventually Jeff starts making some bad decisions he gets in trouble in class and he gets in more trouble then he gets suspended from recess and just and then the next thing you know he starts really going down a bad path mm. and starts using drugs and alcohol and eventually and again I this is a long this is not a long story but it probably takes about 10 minutes to tell on the podcast on the warrior kid podcast and then eventually I leave high school we graduate from high school and I kind of talk about seeing him and and this is what's true like so this is true so this is based on true story I had a best friend when I was a kid his name was Jeff he was an awesome kid he was funny and what he's one of those kids I've talked about this before like some kids they have a little spark to them and it's not a lot it's very few kids they have this little spark they've got this little thing about them that you go okay that person has something Mm -hmm. now that spark doesn't guarantee anything it, in fact, that spark can be a problem because it, that spark can catch fire mm. and it can be an uncontrollable fire mm. or it can be a fire that can be used to fuel and grow and create awesome things. Mm. And you don't really know. So you can't really control it. That person has to have control of that spark. Well, Jeff was one of those kids that had like this spark to him. He was charismatic. He was funny. He was smart. He was witty. He was courageous. But he just, for whatever reason, had like a little spin to him that didn't mind getting in trouble. It's almost like an attitude like, hey, these guys can't hold me down. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we were in fifth grade, it was actually in fifth grade where we sat next to each other every day and we would start, you know, we we would just hang out all the time and laugh. And eventually he started getting in trouble and I didn't, right? And I would get in some trouble, 
but he would cross the line and he crossed the line to where all of a sudden you know he would get he'd sent to the principal's office and be that kind of trouble mm-hmm. one level above the kind of trouble I would get in which is like hey get yelled at you got to be quiet hey you know you go sit in the corner those things I got mm-hmm. but I didn't cross the line which is hey I'm not I'm out of control in the class I'm so disruptive that you got to get me out of class I never crossed that line he started crossing that line mm-hmm. and eventually you know like a, and I told him the story you know he started using drugs and alcohol and I thought about it do I want to put talk about drugs and alcohol in the warrior kid podcast and then I thought to myself yes I do mm. because if you don't think kids hear about drugs and alcohol right now when they're seven years old eight years old nine years old you're wrong drugs are out there it's a different world and you might as well tell them when they're young that these things are problematic mm. well with Jeff you know Jeff went down the path of starting to you know smoke and drink and and all that stuff doing drugs and I didn't I you know he started getting into that kind of thing I started getting into like hardcore music and being like disciplined and all that stuff which mm. again I call it what you want call it a trend call it me conforming to something or whatever you want to call it but that's what I did that's what I got into I related to it let me put it to you that way so eventually Jeff becomes like a burnout you know what I mean he he becomes um, yeah like a burnout you know he he'd cut classes and he you know just kind of went down that spiral and the weird thing is we were such good friends when we were kids that it, we didn't not like each other anymore mm. you know I didn't like have a falling out with him we just we just went our separate ways mm. and so when I would see him in school or I'd see him in the hallway or I'd see him in town you know we would talk and you could see I could see in his eyes like in his eyes like he knew he was going in the wrong direction mm. And we would still laugh and we would still have a good time. We would joke about things and then we'd we'd walk away from each other and he'd keep kept going down the path he was going down and I kept going down the path I was going on. And as time went by, you know, he just was a complete burnout. I, I don't even remember if he graduated high school or not. I graduated high school and I joined the Navy. And, you know, I was gonna go try and be a SEAL. That was my big, big goal, right? And he was gonna do whatever he was gonna do. And the last time I saw him, again, like I remember I saw him and it was like in my mind, and I wasn't quite mature enough to really recognize what I what I saw, like at the time. Mm. But as I look back on it, it was like there was like this element of sadness for him, seeing that I was go I was like, for lack of a better word, like getting away, right? I was gonna go. Mm. I was gonna go and do something, mm. right? And he was gonna not. And you could see that. And at this point, like I don't even know if he could have gotten in the military. He'd been in quite a bit of trouble and had used a lot of drugs. And I don't even know if he could have gotten in the military at this point. So and and but when we were little kids, mind you, we were running around playing BB gun wars and you know setting up forts and running around in camouflage outfits. You know that's what we were doing. So it's like I was going to do that for real, and he was going to keep doing what he was doing, which was mm. not good stuff. And so when I saw him for the for the last time. You know, like we shook hands and again, like I could see in his eyes this this element of sadness that he was doing what he his life had gone in this direction and my life had gone in this other direction. And he was I don't even want to use the term jealous because I don't think he was jealous. He wasn't jealous at all. He he was absolutely he was actually like pr- kind of proud. You could see in his eyes, like, man, that's awesome. Mm. And he said, like, good luck, you know, and we shook hands and, and bro hugged and then I then I just you know I left I joined the Navy and went to boot camp and and I remember I was in SEAL training and I was probably a month or two into SEAL training and I talked to my mom and um, she told me that, that this guy this guy Jeff who'd been my best friend from probably first grade through like fifth grade and then uh, like I said it separated but he killed himself and 19 years old he killed himself and and so in the in the story that Uncle Jake tells, I don't tell that. I don't talk about suicide, um, but I just say that he he died, mm. and he died from drugs and alcohol, which indirectly is true. Um, you know that's what killed him is that he was doing drugs and drinking, and he wasn't making clear decisions, and mm. went down that path of of depression, and and ended up killing himself. And and I remember going, you know, I was going through SEAL training, so I was you know definitely shocked and and saddened by it and I had to do work and 
it was one of those things but as I looked back on it like these are just little tiny decisions like I made a decision he made a decision I made a decision he made a decision I made a, a positive decision about something he made a negative decision I made a good decision he made a bad decision these aren't huge decisions that I'm talking about yeah but it was these little tiny decisions that added up over time and I think a lot of times kids they don't recognize that. They don't recognize that these little, I mean, sure, if you make a one big bad decision, you go drinking and driving, yep, you're right. You can you can kill yourself, you can kill someone else, you can ruin your whole life in one bad decision. Yeah. But where did that one bad decision came from? It came from a bunch of bad decisions. It came from hanging around with the bad people, it came with starting to drink in the first place, it came with even having the attitude that I can get away with stuff. Like There's a lot of little bad decisions that led up to this one bad, big bad decision that actually ends up putting you in a bad way. Yeah. So. That's the story that I just told on the Warrior Kid podcast. And again, I, I know it's kind of a heavy story. In fact, it's a very heavy story. And that's another thing with, like, as I said to myself, well, should I talk about, should I say that he ended up in jail or something like that? Mm. And I was, said to myself, no. Like, this is the reality of life. And if kids are are not taught the reality of life, again, yeah, I'm not trying to, smack them in the face with it I'm not trying to 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 make them paranoid you know and that's kind of why I thought the suicide part was a step too far yeah. but you know it's like in Mikey and the dragons I I talk about how there's dragons that are ready to kill mm. and luckily you know I'm publishing I own the publishing company that's making this book because a lot of my editors probably wouldn't like to hear that a, a normal Children's editor doesn't want to hear killing yeah. right and as and and also in the book the the king dies right the the king is dead mm. and he's there's a funeral for him and that was another thing like well how, how, do you really want to talk about that with little kids mm -hmm. and as I asked my that self that question for the first time I answered it in like a millisecond with there's kids out there whose dad dies when they're five years old, whose mom dies when they're seven years old, whose mm -hmm. grandma dies, whose dog dies. Like death is part of life. Mm -hmm. And to pretend that it doesn't exist and hope that your kids are just gonna one day figure it out, that's, that's yeah. not the right thing to do. They should understand it. And so the, the last part about this thing about Jeff was, you know, again, he had this spark. He was funny and he was just a really good, awesome guy. And I, when I got done, you know what I did? I did like the typical, um, whatever, 11 o'clock at night sitting at the computer thing when I got done writing this thing, and I just Googled him. Mm. I just Googled him and just Googled his name, his full name, and it was the weirdest thing because when I Googled him, there was nothing. There was nothing. N no, Nothing. Not a name, you couldn't, his name, no obituary, no nothing, just nothing. And that kind of shook me up a little bit. And the way it shakes me up is, it shakes me up in the fact that that guy had more intelligence than me. He had more talent than me. He was more charismatic than me. He had all these things that were better than me. And yet, Google, which I don't know if you ever Google, because like, I Google a lot of stuff all the time, because I, I Google you know people that were in the military, I Google uh, old authors, poets, um, people that wrote some random, like I'll, I'll find online some letter from some Lance Corporal in World War II. I'll Google that person. Yeah. And guess what? That person will, there'll be an article about him. There'll be, there'll be his obituary about what he did with his life. And that's, that's what, about his wife. And then his wife died in 19, you know, 68. And she had done, and so you can get so much information about just anyone, mm. anyone. And so I Google my friend Jeff, and there's nothing. Nothing. And that's a person that Jeff, had he gone down the right path, he would have left a giant mark on the world and would have done a lot of positive things and done beautiful things in the world. Mm. And to think that it's all gone and it's all lost, it's lost, and there's not a damn thing about him. So teach your kids to make the right decisions is what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so much for the, uh, like I said, so much for the levity yeah. of, the, of the situation or of the podcast. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's crazy how, like, you know, obviously I, I didn't know Jeff, but like how you say, you, like you were talking earlier, how, it, you know, if you would have made maybe even three, three good decisions, mm-hmm. you know, because like these problems, like drugs and alcohol and mm-hmm. stuff like that as an individual problem, that's not the maker or the breaker right mm-hmm. there. It's like everything put together, you know, there's people who are successful that may struggle with drugs and alcohol mm-hmm. even for a little bit for a long time ongoing like you know yeah you don't have to die you know yeah. w- if you make the decision to do th- the mistake in my opinion right. but to do drugs and drink alcohol you know or have that kind of hold you back or whatever mm-hmm. you don't have to die from that it's like everything you know and yeah, he d- could have been potentially like massively successful totally. you know just because of the decision that's the that's the horrible thing about it is you just see the waste of human potential. Yeah. I guess that's to me is the is a horrible thing and and I got these great memories. Yeah. Like I got them right now. I can remember doing things with him and and when you're with someone like that and you're almost like a spectator to their life. Like you get to watch them. Yeah. You get to go like, "Wow, look at what he's doing. This is crazy." Yeah. Or, "Wow, look at that. Look how funny he is." You get to be a spectator and you appreciate it. I did. Mm-hmm. I appreciated it. And right now I look back and I think about how funny and, and you know, I think about any random, you know, stand up comedian or someone on a uh, Saturday Night Live or something like that. And it's like, yeah, I know he would have been awesome on that show. Yeah. He would have been hilarious on that show. Yeah. But never going to happen. It's not doesn't exist. And yeah, so so those little decisions that people make. And that kids make, especially. Yeah. You know what's f- weird too is when you're 19 years old. Think about, think about how much you thought you knew when you were 19, and how much you actually know yeah. knew when you were 19. Yeah. It's 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 a pathetic. Yeah. It's it's you know so little when you're yeah. 19. Yeah. You know so little when you're 19. Yeah. Man, I feel like you kind of know. It. Well, I don't know. People are different, but man, even t- 29. For sure. I feel like I didn't really know. No, I, I, every five years that you look back, you realize that you didn't know anything five years ago. Yeah, yeah. And maybe someone will chime in and tell me that when you're 72, you you feel pretty good about what you know. <laughs> but I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. I think it's just always constantly looking back five years and think to yourself. And you know what I've said before? It's like, I think when you get to be, at some point, some, some decade along there, 35, 40, you at least say, I know I don't know everything. Yeah, and yeah. that is like the beginning of yeah. knowing something. Because yeah. when you're, like, like you said, when you're 19, you, know, you think you know everything. When you're 23, you think you know everything. When you're 26, you think you know everything. When you're 31, you still think you know everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not until you actually look up, maybe that's 35, maybe that's 37. Maybe some people get it younger mm-hmm. where they realize, you know what? I don't know everything and I need yeah. to learn more. Yeah. <sighs> so... There you Speaking go. Speaking of learning more. Yeah, Q&A. The people have some questions. Let's see if Jocko mm-hmm. has the answers. I don't I don't necessarily have the answers. The No, but I have I I will be able to give my assessment. Sure. I will say this, and I just got done telling Pete this. Sure. Yesterday, and I probably have told you this before. If I ever tell you I know something 100% yeah. then it's factually true. Okay. But I do that so rarely. It's very rare that I say, hey, here's the here's the answer. I probably do that. I do that very, very seldomly. Yeah. If you hear me say that, go with it. Go with it's it. It's correct. <laughs> you won't barely hear me. You probably, you may have never heard me say that up yeah. until this point. Not that I can remember, yeah. no. I, I very rarely will say, hey, look, I know this 100%. I used to say it once every, maybe twice every six months. Like when I was in the SEAL teams, hmm. I would, every once in a while, I'd have to say, listen, man, I'm telling you, this is how you want to do this. You, you, This is how you should do this. I'm telling you. Yeah. Do it this way. Very seldom. Most of the time I'd say, look, this is what I think you should do, but it's your decision. You can do what you want. Yeah. All right, well. So I will give my assessment. I'll give my best possible. And the other thing is these questions are, there's not a lot of detail to them 
often or there's a ton of detail but even a ton of detail isn't like let, like let me talk oh you got a problem with your boss i need to meet your boss i need to talk to him you interact with him every day i don't yeah so you need to kind of you need to kind of modulate and and hone the answers to your particular scenario yeah so what do you think about this particular scenario okay, Jocko? is it better to work in a mindless job and make money or is it better to follow your passion and possibly make less money? Hmm. I, I definitely think the best thing to do is work at a job that you're passionate about sure. and make a lot of money. <laughs> that, that, that's that's the best thing to do. I do know that one. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not always possible. And, and here's something you gotta be careful of. Y have you ever heard people talk about making your hobby your job, yeah, right? Yeah. And generally that's like, oh, I, if I make my hobby my job, then I'll enjoy my job, yeah. right? There's another way of looking at it. If you make your hobby your job, you won't like your hobby anymore. Yeah. That's another way of looking at that. So it depends on what kind of, like a jujitsu instructor, yeah. right? Hey, I'll just open my own school and then I'll just I'll just get to do what I love all day long. Yeah. You talk to a lot of jujitsu instructors after six years, they don't even like going to the academy. They don't want to go to the academy anymore because it's all this, oh, ah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to teach one other white belt how to do an arm lock. They're <laughs> over it. So it's not necessarily the best thing to make what you're passionate about. In, and there's some people that teach jiu-jitsu every single day and they love it and that's awesome. Yeah. And so they've they've won, right? Because yeah. they're making money, they're doing, they have a good livelihood and they enjoy doing it. Yeah. So yeah, but my, my goal would be to to do something that I'm passionate about. At the same time, you got to set yourself up so that you're not stuck without any money, right? Because yeah. passion doesn't pay the rent. I'll tell you a, an example of this. Greg Train. Sure. Years ago, Greg Train said to me, "Hey, here's my options. I can like kind of scrape by, teach wrestling, teach some jujitsu, and train to fight, or I can." Guy got accepted into this program to be an X-ray technician, yep. and he asked me. He's like, "What do you What do you think I should do?" This was a long time ago. It's probably like ten or twelve years ago, yeah. maybe even longer. Yeah. Anyways, he asked me, and I said, "Listen, how many hours a day do you want to train?" And I said, "How many hours a day can you train?" Yeah. And he's like, "I don't know, maybe three or four hours a day." Okay. So if you want to do this three or four hours a day and you're not gonna make any money, what are you gonna do with the other, whatever, 20 hours a day? Yeah. You could actually build a career and make real money doing the x-ray thing, and then you could still easily, because you work eight hours a day. I was, like, I was like, Greg, I work 12 hours a day. I work 14 hours a day, I'm still here training. Mm -hmm. You can work an eight hour day and still train, and you can train four hours a day. And you can be fine. And you'll have money. You won't have to worry about paying the rent. You won't have to. You'll be able to buy, you know, nice things. You'll have medical insurance. All those things. Yeah. And he made the decision mm -hmm. to go to X-ray school, and he ended up d doing great in jujitsu and doing great in fighting. And he ended up getting some injuries that were like, if he would have just been a fighter, they would have been really problematic because mm -hmm. you know he couldn't fight for a long time. He, so, um, that's the kind of that's the kind of judgment call. Yeah. Right. You can exactly. make. Um, now, what what this question is saying though is, can you do something where you make a little bit less, but you're passionate about it? That's that's pretty easy call as far as I'm concerned. If you just make a little bit less, but you love doing it, well, that's yeah. kind of a no brainer. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? Now you gotta ask yourself, where does that put you in the future? And then you gotta ask yourself, on the other side, is could you do this job that you don't really like? for long enough that you could make a difference? Like you could do this job that you don't really like and you, all of a sudden you got a down payment for a house and then you go buy a house. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's that's not a bad, movie, a bad move either. But you could also, this is where people trap themselves. They have the job that they don't like, they're making a little bit more money. And instead of investing towards getting out of that job and setting themselves up so where they can do something that they are passionate about, what they do is they, expand their lifestyle yeah that, that's the big mistake yeah. they expand their lifestyle and all of a sudden you know they're making a hundred thousand dollars a year at this job that they don't really like the other job they were going to get seventy five thousand dollars a year 
And that that's not bad, right? I would probably go for the thing that I really like doing. If it's a difference of $25,000, that's kind of a no-brainer to me. Mm-hmm. What does the person do? They say, okay, well, I'll just stay in this job so I can make enough money to get a down payment on a house. And then what do they do? They buy a new car. Yeah. They go out to dinner every night. Mm-hmm. They spend that extra 25000 that they could be putting into saving up for down payment. They spend it on stuff that they don't need. They end up with a $110,000 lifestyle while they're making $100,000 a year. And they actually go into debt. And now they're further away from the job that they wanted. Yeah. So, I guess the answer here is, and I've said this before, come up with an exit strategy with contingencies if things go wrong, Mm -hmm. and then plan, save, prepare, and then execute. Yeah. Yeah, Amen. Sounds like a good plan. Good take on it. That's what it sounds like. The... uh, I found that when you make your hobby your career, mm-hmm. that a lot of times, like when you have fantasies about doing your hobby as a career, let's say I'm a photographer, right? That's a big one. That's a common one that mm-hmm. I've heard. They'll be like, okay, because I like taking pictures. I mm-hmm. like, you know, I don't know, maybe traveling or I don't mm-hmm. know, whatever. Whatever I like taking pictures of, I like that kind of subject too. Uh, but so a lot of things when you're, um, you know, a creative person or you, you're into, uh, let's say you make baskets, right? Mm-hmm. You make the awesome baskets, mm-hmm. but to make it your career, a lot of the times it comes with like yeah. 50%, if not a hundred percent additional chores and tasks by running that business. Yeah. I, I was going to say, yeah, you like making baskets. Oh yeah. Cool. And what you end up doing is making thousands of the same baskets oh, that they're yeah. going to put their green with the Easter bunny in it. And that's what your job is to weave that basket yeah. over and over again. Everything that you're doing it for is now gone. Yeah. And, and guess what? You have to do it. Now. And you have to do you it. You have to like as a hobby, that's kind of, in my opinion, pr- pretty much the, one of the two things that make a hobby so great is because it's fun to do and you can do it whenever you want. <laughs> as long as you have the time, as long as you, you do it whenever you want. If you don't feel like doing yeah, it, you don't do it. Yeah. Like if, if you don't feel like golfing tomorrow, you, yeah. Are you I don't go? feel like golfing I tomorrow. Know. Are you going to go? No, I'm not. Oh, no, you don't. Yeah, of course not. You don't have to. But if you love making baskets and you don't feel like it, and you're like, hey, guess what? You got to make a thousand of those. I know you don't feel like even making one. You got to make a thousand now or make sure they're done or yeah. something. Then you're like, man, I used to love this thing. Now I don't really like it because all this pressure, which had nothing to do with my hobby, by the way. Nothing. Now it has everything to do with my hobby. Now you got. Now I have people calling me saying, hey, where's my basket? Hey, I'm the basket maker. I say when the basket gets made kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That's gone. Yeah. So, yeah, so you don't really like it. And so, yeah, you got the repetitiveness, the, the, the like, we call lack it of the, control, lack of control, the pressure, the pressure, and then that's not to mention like <laughs> the day to day chores that allow your hobby activity to be a business or, or career or whatever. Man, it's a lot like freaking t- taxes. Oh, man. Taxes? Doing all that. Yeah, man. You know how like when you you work at like a job and yeah. the taxes are just taken out. The taxes are oh, taken yeah, out yeah, and yeah, all this yeah. stuff. But man, you're weaving baskets, you know, in your in your new garage or whatever. Man, you got to do yeah. your taxes, all this. I don't know, man. There, there's just a lot more to it when oh, you switch yeah, over yeah, yeah, from yeah. hobby to career. Yeah, that's true. So that's my, gonna be my shout out to my tax guy, <laughs> Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> he rocks so hard. I know, man. He's the best guy ever. <laughs> yeah, I, I can dig it. But yeah, so there's that. And then, but yeah, if you're prepared for that, though, if you're totally prepared for that, or if you kind of like business, you know, that part of it, because yeah. there's a lot of chores in business. Yeah. And if you like that stuff, oh, man, that can be good. But yeah. And, oh, and here's the thing, too, about when you get a good job, or not a good job, but a high paying job, but you don't like it. Mm-hmm. This is why, this is what I think, anyway. I don't think I've ever had a junk job that paid a lot <laughs> you just had junk low paying jobs <laughs> yes yes, yes. I, I had a few of those yes for sure um so okay i go i wake up i go to my job drag myself to my job right drag myself and then i can't wait to get home i get home i get that paycheck after a week two weeks or whatever i get that huge paycheck and then i, I gotta drag myself to my job again and i go home and i can let me read so basically your day-to-day for that junk job is so junk. I need something. I need pleasure. I need some for kind sure. of pleasure in my life. Let me buy that cool new car. So now, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, I'll yeah. drag yeah, myself yeah. to my job, but yeah. at least I'm rolling in that new nice new car. Yeah. Or but eventually sh- you trap yourself with that car. Exactly. That car is right. a trap because that right. becomes the focus a lot of the times. Yeah. You know, you're like to make up. And I believe so. This is an interesting thing I've thought about. People like to make things. People like to make things. Like it's a it's a, it's a good feeling to yeah. make something yeah. to create something. Yeah. And I think a lot of the consumer 
attitude mm. comes from the fact that, look, I don't have time to go and build a desk. Mm. And I wish I did have time to go build a desk, but I'll just go click on this button and the desk will show up at my house. And it's kind of like I created something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> voila, there it is. Yeah, voila, there it is. And the, and that gives you that. Li- but the thing is, it's a, it's a short-term gratification. Yeah, that's it why is, it keeps going. Yeah, that, and that's why it keeps going. Because you go, okay, I'd really like to make a desk, but I'm just going to buy this one. Or I'd really like to, you know what I'd love to do is just is just completely refurbish an old car. Oh, I can't do that, but guess what? I can I can just buy a new car and then I'm rolling. It feels good for a minute. Mm-hmm. But you don't get the pure you don't get the deep satisfaction that you would have gotten had you refurbished the car. Yeah. So you get you trap yourself. So keep your spending in check. This is another part of this whole deal. Keep yeah. the spending in check. But that spending feels so good. And then you know how like when you have It depends. Like- because there's sometimes when you don't have a lot of money, spending hurts. You know, oh, yeah. it hurts when you're like, I can't separate myself from this money. Yeah, and you have you have a different mindset, I think. But I think like a, your average person, me included, is like the the spending hurts when you spend stuff spend on stuff you need rather than what you like want. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's so backwards. I'm saying, dude. oh yeah, it is. That's so backwards. Oh, big time. But it's it's a short term thing for yeah, sure. It's yeah. like the the immediate like satisfaction is like when you gotta pay. Let's say you you don't really have dental insurance. Right. Or mm-hmm. let's say you do, but you still got to pay out about whatever. You got to spend your money on that. Yeah. Let's say it's one thousand dollars, and you have fifteen hundred dollars in your bank account. We'll say. So it doesn't feel good to spend on dental, but it would have felt good to buy a new plasma screen oh, TV man. that you could watch the UFC Think about on. It. Think about it, yeah. bro. When that plasma TV <clears throat> comes in, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to hook this up. This thing is awesome. I'll even put it on my credit card and pay for that thing over the next twelve months. Yeah, fifty percent interest <laughs> on this thing. I'll do that, no problem, because of that pleasure of getting it. But, oh, dental? You mean this toothache will go away? This toothache that's causing me a migraine will go away? And then I got to, you know, then when it's time to pay that bill, you're like, it's hard, man. You don't really want it. It's weird. Yeah, it is backwards. All right. Well, like I said, come up with a plan. Come up with an exit strategy with contingencies and then save your money and execute. Get some. Check. Next question. How do you suggest setting SOPs? Standard operating procedures where none currently exist. Yeah, good question. And this is a Not gonna spend a ton of time on this Well, the best way to to develop SOPs is to let them be developed organically sort of from the people that are actually doing that task whatever it is and you kind of you, you just turn what's actually happening into an SOP and then if there's multiple methods happening for something you kind of consolidate the methods into the best way and then test them and then you'll have your SOP there. One thing that you shouldn't do with an SOP is come up with a standard operating procedure inside of a vacuum and then push it down on the folks below you in the chain of command because they're gonna be, they're gonna reject it. Um, They are going to, they they are going to know a better way of doing it because you made it up in a vacuum. So, So don't do that. Now, there are some times where, let's say you're gonna do something brand new that's never been done before and you have to kind of create an SOP then if you have to do that you you need to kind of explain to the team hey listen guys we've never done this type of mission before we've never done this type of project before here's my best guess at what a standard operating procedure is gonna look like we're gonna try and execute this but believe me it's not perfect I'm open to feedback and I realize that it's gonna change, but I wanna at least have a line for us to deviate from. And actually this is in extreme ownership. I talked about how we started organizing the SSE, the sensitive site, sensitive site exploitation. It's how we searched buildings. Mm. And it's in the book, but when you first when we first started searching buildings, we'd everyone would just go in and ransack everything and just throw everything around and mm. it was totally ridiculous and ineffective. And eventually, you know, I said, Okay, we need a standard operating procedure and my assistant platoon commander I said, Hey, come up with a standard operating procedure of how we're gonna do this. He did that. And when he did, of course, and it's in the book, people were like, Oh, this is gonna take forever and it was like, Okay, listen, we're gonna try it. Mm. If there's some adjustments we gotta make, we'll make them. But let's at least give it a try it and that's what we did. Um and one of the best things you can do if you have to come up with an SOP is not only let it come organically from the task itself, but let the people that are actually doing the task come up with the standard operating procedures. So if you had, if you had some 
project that you did over and over again, I wouldn't come and say, hey, okay, here's how I want, how I want you to do this project from now on, Echo. Mm-hmm. I'd say, hey, Echo, since you're doing this all the time, can you capture what it is you do and, and we can take those best practices, turn them into a standard operating procedure and get them the whole, through the whole organization? Mm-hmm. And you'd say, oh, that's cool. You would kind of feel some ownership of oh, that yeah. and yeah. then you would put together a good plan. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty straightforward with standard operating procedures. The, the main thing is let them develop, let the team develop them, keep an open mind, don't force them down people's throat. Makes sense. All right, next question. I'm a 17 year old. I'm a blue belt in Jiu Jitsu, which Mm -hmm. I received a few days after my 16th birthday. And I I have ambitions of pursuing Jiu Jitsu professionally and competing to the highest level possible. Of course, this requires discipline and commitment. So during the school term, I train Jiu Jitsu Monday through Saturday. And I weight train on Friday and Sunday. And when I have time off school, I train jiu-jitsu three times a day. However, due to my commitment to this and my refusal to prioritize the other things over this, I feel I'm missing out on the social opportunities of, of this part of my life. I miss parties and social events in order to train jiu-jitsu and weight train because I know that I should have the discipline to do so. However, I feel lonely and isolated because of it. Is this just weakness or should I make the occasional exception for a social event? Once again, love the work you do, you and Echo do. It's it's helped me immensely. Thanks from the UK. All right, the UK. Um, First of all, it's just, okay, the hardcore, here's a couple hardcore answers. Mm -hmm. The hardcore answer number, what's your schedule like, right? Are you wasting any time? Have you you maximized the hours you can get out of a day? Or are you spending time doing other things that you shouldn't be doing? Mm. That being said, it sounds like you're getting after it pretty hard, which means you're probably pretty efficient. And if you're if you're not wasting a bunch of time and you're not doing a bunch of things that are non-productive and you're feeling lonely and isolated, then guess what? You're going too far. Yeah. You don't you should not be feeling lonely and isolated. That's not good. You need to relax, especially because if you're training that much, you're likely overtraining. So, broadly speaking, now, broadly speaking, training should be enjoyable. Okay, this doesn't mean that you're going to love it every day, and I talk about that all the time. It doesn't mean every day you wake up and you're all, you know, smile from one ear to the other ear because you're so happy you got to go do, you know, squats and deadlifts. Like, no, no, that doesn't happen. But broadly, the way it makes you feel. The way jujitsu makes you feel should make. Are there times when you go on the jujitsu mat and you get spanked, and you get ground out, and you get tapped out, and you feel like junk? Yes, that's going to happen. But again, broadly, how does jujitsu make you feel? It makes you feel good. You should enjoy it to some extent, right? And you should not be getting burnt out. And I think that's the most important thing: is that you shouldn't be getting burnt out on jujitsu. On working out and and this is this is important especially for your 17 years old there is more to life than jujitsu and physical fitness right there's more to there's more to there's more to doing well in life than just jujitsu and physical fitness so a couple things if you can't if you can't like communicate with people effectively, th- that's a real problem in any environment, mm-hmm. right? And if you're isolating yourself from other people and you're not, you're not learning how to interact with other human beings in a social environment, that's not good. And it's not only it's not only that it's it's not only that it's just not good for you because yes, you as a person you need to be well rounded. You need to be, yes, you need to be strong. You need to be capable from a fighting perspective, but you also need to be smart. You need to be articulate. You need to be quick witted. And those things are mandatory skills in life. I mean, if you're a black belt in jujitsu, and you're a white belt in communicating with other human beings, that's not going to be a good situation for you. And the other thing is, the better you are, the more well-rounded you are in all these other aspects of life, those things will actually make you better at jujitsu too because you'll be able to read people. You'll be able to deal with confrontation. You'll be able to understand other people's motivations. And all those things come from interacting with other human beings. So I get it. I get the massive commitment 
And that is what it takes. Like if you want to compete at the highest level, I'm telling you, yes, you have to live, breathe, and eat jujitsu. You have to live, breathe, and eat conditioning. And that being said, if that's all you live, breathe, and eat, that's going to make you less apt to be a champion than if you make yourself a little bit more well-rounded in some of these other aspects. So, dude, keep training hard. 17-year-old blue belt from UK. Keep training hard. Go out occasionally. Hang out with some people. Have a good time. And that by no means means get hammered every time you do it. not at all. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that social aspect, man, that's like, that's, it seems like a lot of times, especially when you're training or you're doing something that's kind of directly or can be viewed as like directly opposite of a social thing. You know, when you think social, you think, oh, you guys are just slacking, hanging out, going to the bar, cruising at the beach, whatever. While, while we're over here training kind of mm-hmm. thing, right? Just like just like people say, oh, you're sleeping on the couch, you know? What are you, lazy sleeping mm-hmm. on the couch? Well, I don't know. Maybe they need rest, you know? Or may- <laughs> there's, there's, there's use in sleeping. Seems like that was a, that was a little maybe kind of a glimpse into maybe. the Echo Charles world right there. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Nonetheless. Why are you sleeping on the couch? Maybe I need rest. Maybe I'm recovering from the workout. You <laughs> see what I'm saying? I'm saying there's two parts of it. You know, there, there's that. And so... And people give it a bad rap, I think, especially like, you know, you know how like, you know, you hear these, you know, motivational gurus grind, all sleep when I'm dead, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Well, I so, say that. So yeah. <laughs> I, you said it, not me, but hey, all right. So, and I'm not saying that, you know, that's dumb or nothing like that. I'm, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying that it, pr- it produces a certain message that can be interpreted in a way that might not be the most beneficial. Well, I'm sure. I think this this I'm glad that he asked this question because he's taking the attitude of like okay I'm gonna sleep when I'm dead and I'm gonna I'm gonna hang out with other human beings after I'm a world champion and again do you need to be possessed to be a world champion yes you do but all I'm saying is part of the things that will make you be a a better well-rounded person the more well-rounded you are the, the better you're gonna perform yeah you know, you're going to learn how to deal with anxiety. You're going to learn how to deal with people. You're going to learn how to look at someone else's situation, look in their eyes and be like, okay, this guy's stressed out or this guy's panicking or this guy, you know, you yeah. learn those things from interacting with other people. Yeah. That's going to make you a better competitor. Yeah. You're going to learn more about yourself. That's going to make you a better competitor. Yeah. And you're going to be, if you, if you relax. Now, what you don't want to do is go so far in the other direction where you, where you show up to a competition and you don't feel like you've prepared as much as you could. Yeah. But that, what does that do? You go too far in the other direction. Now you overtrained. Yeah. So you got to find a little bit of. It sounds like you're a little bit off balance, especially because you're feeling like the words that kind of keyed me off the most in this was what was it? Lonely and isolated. Yeah. That, that's what kind of. If you said everything else here, and then you were like, um, "Am I overtraining?" I would have said, "No, man, you're getting after it. Good job." But then when you say, "Look, I feel lonely and isolated." You don't want to feel lonely and isolated. Like, and that's another thing. When I train jiu-jitsu, that's kind of where I hang out. Like, I don't interact with people yeah. normally. It's a social thing. We might not even talk. We might not even say one word other than, uh, do you want to roll? And then we train. Mm-hmm. That's sort of my social activity mm-hmm. of, of hanging around with other people. And I don't feel, I leave the gym and I feel like I hung around with a lot of people. I didn't say anything to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... If you feel lonely and isolated, that's not good. That's getting to you. That means your mind is starting to be worn down from this. Don't let it get worn down. It's going to refuel you to go out. It's going to watch this. Watch this. If you're feeling lonely and isolated, your workout that day is like a nine. If you feel like, like, hey, I'm having a good life. I'm, I'm filled with energy. I like hanging out. I just, you know, had a good time with this girl last night. And now I'm going to train. It's like, oh, okay. Guess what? That workout's nine point seven. You get a better training because you had a good time. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't like the I don't like the fact that he says he's lonely and isolated. That's not good. And uh, again, this is just a dichotomy because then you'll get someone that says, okay, well, Jocko said go out and you know have party, you know party, party, party with the ladies. Sure. And yeah. then and then help the next, my workout. Yeah, it'll help my workout. And then the, well, you know. Maybe if I only work out three times a week and I spend most of my time partying, mm-hmm. I'll be just 
I'll get workouts level 11. No, you won't. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, man. Make some exceptions to your discipline and go enjoy the company of some other people. Grow a little bit as a person. Become a better human. Compete better. Train harder. That's it. Agree. So, man, this is a a concept that I think is if you can kind of incorporate or understand this concept in, you know, when you're working hard at something. Mm -hmm. So when I was young... When I first started lifting weights, first started, I don't know, 15 or what, however old I was. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you know how when you lift weights and you get that little pump, right? To yes. me, to me, I thought that that's literally my muscles growing, you know, like I didn't know how it all worked. Mm-hmm. I was like, dang, my muscle, I can see the growth mm-hmm. already. <laughs> so all I got to do is lift every single day and watch oh, yeah, out yeah. quick, you know, because most people, they won't work as hard as me because I'll just, because w- w- I like doing it. I like to pump whatever. Um, so I would do, we, I was, remember uh, the guy, my friend, I mentioned Eric Masters, pilot in the Air Force. Yes. So he, he, the, the one, he always had the soda above the microwave yep, there. Yep. Anyway, so the, I'd lift with his, him and his dad would invite me and my brother mm-hmm. over. We'll, we'll lift. And he started off with bench and, you know, this stuff. So we go lift and I'm like, dang, I feel all pumped. So now when I, when we trans kind of went into, I want to say like varsity football, I don't know. Anyway, we were, we started lifting in the weight room at the high school. So I would do the same thing every single day, every single oh, day, yeah. every single day. And my friend was like, this other guy I know, he goes, hey, you, you are you benching every single day? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, bro, your muscles aren't going to grow. Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about? Of course they do. They grow every single day. Like I feel it even. <laughs> He's like, bro, you don't know how it works. He's like, you don't, when you lift, they don't grow. They actually get torn. They get like almost like a little micro injury. That, mm. That's how it works. And then when you rest and when you sleep and when you eat, then they grow. And I was like, what? And it did. It still didn't make sense. So I was like, okay, I guess, you know. He's like, you ever heard, you know, when the, the soreness, you know, when you get the soreness or whatever? I was like, yeah. He's like, that's like it, like hurt, like kind of injured or whatever. And then it has to heal up. And when it heals up, it heals up bigger. And I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, so you can't bench every day. Otherwise, it'll just like it just won't grow. It'll always be damaged. I was like, oh, it makes sense. So that rest in between workouts mm-hmm. is kind of important, given my goal. <laughs> grow some muscles. You see what I'm saying? Where this kind of thing where it's like all go, all go, no rest. Right? You need that rest mm-hmm. to grow, mm-hmm. literally. Mm-hmm. And that goes for anything. Truth. And this is kind of the next question is very closely related to this. And that's why I put it kind of like right next to it. Yeah. And that is, Jocko, I should have asked in Muster 006, is there a dichotomy dichotomy in the unmitigated, unmitigated daily discipline in all things? Yeah, and like I said, this is why I put this question here, because it's related to the question, the answer that I just gave, which is, yes, you can. You, you can overdo it. And there is a dichotomy. You can put so much focus on working. Um... You can put so much working, so much focus on working that you lose track of your family, yeah. and everything goes down tail with your family. Or you can do the opposite: put so much focus on your family that you lose track of that you don't do what you're supposed to do at work. Um, so you need to back off a little, um, and you get people that waste time on things that don't matter. Mm. This goes back. Remember the podcast we did where I was talking about how like a black belt, when a white belt's grabbing, grabbing a black belt sleeve yeah. and it just doesn't matter. Yeah. There's people that think that dis- it's important that I do this thing this certain way mm-hmm. and the reality is it's useless, it doesn't matter. You're being OCD, yeah. right? You're being OCD. So, or, or you maybe not being full OCD, but you're being borderline. You gotta think yeah. about what's important and what's not important. And if you're, dis- if you generally, or oftentimes, people that are hyper-disciplined about little things, a lot of times they're missing their discipline in other areas of their life. And one of them, and and we've talked about this before too, which is somebody that, just because someone is hyper-disciplined in their physical fitness doesn't mean that they're disciplined in their rest of their life in many other ways, whether it's financial, whether it's their relationships, whatever, like everything, they can be screwing every, they're super disciplined in weighing their food and doing macro calorie counting and all that stuff, right? Oh, yeah. And yet, they haven't paid their phone bill yeah. or whatever, and they've got financial issues or they've got health, like other health issues. Mm-hmm. And so, you need to you need to back off enough on the little things that don't matter 
that uh, so that the things that matter you can actually take care of now the weird dichotomy in this is again it always comes up the Russian soldiers in the Chechen war not shaving is it really important that they shave N- not really but what's really important is that they have discipline overall and when they stop shaving they, they let go of their discipline and mm. that was the problem now so you, there, there is about that's what I'm saying there's a balance yeah. and I guess let me let me make that a little more clearly if we were in a war and what I was focused on was echo you better shave tomorrow that was my big focus mm. echo your uniform better be squared away tomorrow like that that is not what the most important the most important thing is like echo do you understand where the fallback positions are? Mm-hmm. Echo, do you understand what your field of fire is? Echo, do you know what you're supposed to do when we start getting overrun? Mm-hmm. Those are what's important. And But if I focus on this little thing that doesn't really matter, that can, that can be a problem. Yeah. So I need to make sure that I'm focused on the correct things. And in life, yes, you can unmitigate a daily discipline if you try to apply it to absolutely everything in your life, mm-hmm. just like prioritize and execute. If you try and solve all your problems at the same time, you won't be able to solve any. If you try and implement perfect discipline in every single thing that you do, mm-hmm. you won't be able to apply discipline to the things that are most important. Yeah. My garage gym, yeah. Floor mm-hmm. is dirty. Okay. <laughs> I sweep it. Sure. Of course. I sweep it every third day. I just sweep it out. But I don't get in there with a bucket and a mop yeah. and c- try and clean the chalk off so it's perfect black. Sure. Why? Because it, Cause doesn't, it doesn't, matter. doesn't matter. Yeah, man. So some things in life are like your gym floor. Yeah. It just it doesn't matter if there's chalk on it. I'm gonna put more chalk on it later The chalk doesn't make me slip. It doesn't make me sick. It doesn't it doesn't but I don't care how it looks yeah. So don't worry about the chalk on the gym floor yeah. In fact, there's gyms in the world where you're not allowed to have chalk because they don't want chalk on the gym floor Th- Those places shouldn't exist in the world. <laughs> they should be they should be illegal. Yes, there should be chalk everywhere yeah. in the gym. Available, yeah, you're right. Four. So don't focus on things that don't matter. There you go. Yeah, man. It's, it seems like the whole discipline equals freedom thing, mm-hmm. and whether you agree with it or not, actually, you know, I think you will agree with this. It's a dance, you know? It's a dance with discipline and freedom. You mean a, a, ba- a balance of a dichotomy? <laughs> yes, it is. In right. fact, I wrote a book about but it. Saying, yeah, thank you. Appreciate you pointing that out to me. <laughs> so, and it's gonna Maybe just, I should take ownership, too. It, it's <laughs> just, it just depends on who you are. Like, you, you're, the discipline is going to be taking the lead big time. You know, and when you exercise your freedom with, I don't know, I don't know, diet wise is like what mint chocolate chip ice cream mm-hmm. or something like this. When you exercise that freedom, it's not going to be very often, but when you do, boom, yeah, you, yeah, it's yeah. going to have benefits. Yeah, and that's when you see somebody that's. Let's just talk about this. Well, when you see somebody that's out of shape, you could say you could say one of two things. You could say not enough discipline, right. or you could say too much freedom. Too right? much freedom. <laughs> we know it's one of those two things. Yes. If you see someone yeah. that's having financial issues, yeah. it's one of two things. Right. Not enough discipline yeah. or, or too much freedom. They're getting out that credit card when they shouldn't be. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah, you, th- th- it goes without saying that it's a balance. It's a dichotomy. That's correct. Yeah. So even, and also on top of that, the, the discipline in all things, because that's the question, right? In all maybe things. You could put, maybe you could write a book called The Dance. The Dance, sure. Of leadership. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just copy the dichotomy <laughs> later. It'll be all good. But the in all things, like discipline in diet, discipline in um, uh, you know workouts and not slacking and whatever, and that looks way different than discipline in like relationships, for example. Like if you're like a different, like to to you know the discipline not to lose your temper or yeah, the yeah. discipline to to respond to a maybe not disciplined person or some let's say someone you love who's who's maybe emotionally different than you or whatever. Hmm. That looks and feels way different, you know, if if you really think about it. So if you're like, hey, I'm not gonna, I don't know. I'm not going to go to the park with my wife because I'm working out. That's my discipline. I'm yeah, no yeah. slack, you know, so, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, so you're lacking the discipline to organize around your relationship exactly properly. Exactly right, with your relationship or, or whatever. you're lacking the discipline to make sure that your wife understands that you're going to train. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm and, going to train, boy. Yeah, but uh, as far as we're like, and now that's back on the training again, but like with like your relationships, unless your relationships aren't important to you, which is, I mean, I would I would argue most times so there's some relationships in your life that that are going to be important. I would argue that. Well, yeah, there should be. 
I think so too. Yes. So that's what you have a seal platoon for. Maintaining (laughs) discipline in those relationships (laughs) looks different. So it might not be as obvious. So when someone says unmitigated, when you say unmitigated discipline in all things, I don't think automatically right off the top of my head, like, oh, you know, my relationship with my wife, you know, or even the relationship with your kids. Like when I think unmitigated daily discipline in all things, including my kids. So I'm going to I'm going to make sure they're disciplined. Oh, but the discipline of your of yourself dealing with the kids, that's a whole different thing. See what I'm saying? True. So you got to kind of keep those in mind. Well, I, I yeah, found, you gotta focus the discipline I found on yourself. Yeah, I found it when I when I keep that in mind, it, it'll help. And then, yeah, and do the dance with freedom. You designate how much freedom you are going to exercise. Mm -hmm. And then you do the dance. See what I'm saying? You balance the dichotomy is what you do. Yeah, yeah. I don't dance, bro. Right, you dance. (laughs) Right. And here's the thing. Come on, man. (laughs) Here's the wrong thing what I made a mistake of at one point a long time ago. I looked at you and I was like, shoot, I need to do that. I need to wake up. I need to, like, do all this stuff or whatever. But... If, if I were to do that, I'd jump myself up. So I can't, like, you can't use, like, the next person as the standard for, as far as the balance goes. Like, you have to designate your own balance. Yeah, because you have to modulate for your life. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. bro. People don't just automatically know that. I know I didn't. Check. Figured it I out. I didn't see you getting up at 4.30 at any point, though. Yeah, I tried. <laughs> and you know that, dude. <laughs> Check. Anyway, next question. Is there one form or type of jujitsu that is better than other forms? Not Japanese versus small circle jujitsu, but pressure versus movement, bottom versus top, different types of quote unquote games. Got it. Yeah. So there's, if you don't know this, there's different types of jujitsu in the world. There's things like he, he mentioned here. There's Japanese jujitsu, and there's something called small circle jujitsu, and then there's just a million different kind of random sort of Names that people will put on jujitsu, right? right? Yeah. The one that we do is generally referred to as Brazilian jujitsu. I just generally refer to it as jujitsu because that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, so there are different types of all the different types of jujitsu. The one that you should be doing is Brazilian jujitsu. The other types are not what you want to be doing. <laughs> we'll see. They're less generally. proven. Yeah. Over yeah. generally. And yeah, so that's just the that's just the reality of it. So now, but then he's asking a different question, which is the inside of inside of even Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's different types of styles yeah. that people will have, and these are people end up calling them games. Like, yeah. what kind of game does this be? person have? Yeah, what kind of game does that person have? And different people have different games, and it depends on their body. The different body types have different styles different games different even different like cardio levels can have different games different styles different flexibility levels different games different styles even different personalities yeah if you have different personalities you'll end up with a different style so the question is are there some games or some styles that are better than other games or other styles inside of (laughs) jujitsu And my answer to that, I think, is no. There's not games that are better than other games, not styles of jiu-jitsu that are better than other styles of jiu-jitsu. It's just different people gravitate towards different ones, and they use them successfully, and that's why they continue to use them. Mm. I would say this, though. If you can, then develop more than one game, right? Yeah. More than one game. Like if all you know how to do is pressure pass, that's the only kind of pass you know, and you come up against someone that's really good at at defending the pressure pass, yeah. you won't be able to pass the guard. Yeah. If you are if you have a really good top game, but you go against a wrestler that's a better wrestler than you and puts you on your back, then that's going to be a problem. Yeah. So you're going to vote and another thing people ask is how do i develop my style the answer is you just train and your style is going to come yeah. you you don't know occasionally someone might tell you like hey you're long and lanky you should use 
triangle, you should set up good triangle games or good darts chokes. Yeah. Or someone says, hey, you're, you got good base, you should you know, use a lot of pressure. So there can be someone giving you some indication, but you're gonna self-select as you train what works, and as you can continue to do what works for you, you'll get better and better at it. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. You say that. It makes sense. Like, just train, and it'll sort of sort itself out. You know, your game, your style. Yeah. Like, and, and the the reason um, this might seem kind of obvious, but the reason why I like these tall, lanky guys, they'll do like triangles and stuff mm-hmm. because when they first start training. Though the triangle is going to come way easier than a guy who's not as mm-hmm. lanky, you know, early on. So they'd be like, oh, shoot, that's successful. So it's kind of like, yeah. check, that that's good. So there again, boom, that becomes part of their game super early. So that kind of uh, is a dominant part of their whole game. And then, the, you know, the more the more they train, the more things are going to start falling into place in their game, you know. And so if you have a lanky person, all those lanky moves are going to register way quicker mm-hmm. than, you know, a shorter guy or a stockier guy. That's, yeah, it's funny how you put that. Just train. It'll, yeah. They'll sort of just... They reveal themselves. They reveal themselves. Yeah, they totally do. Check. Yeah, this, those- this, this question also ties into the next question, so I kind of coupled it up with the next question as well. Did you do you feel well? You know how your answer to the is there a better game or whatever? Mm-hmm. I feel like you know, like when you watch ADCC mm-hmm. or something like this, and then you have a guy like Hodger who's six four, mm-hmm. you know, and then you have Marcelo Garcia, he, guys who are arguably like just as good, the two yeah, yeah. best guys ever to do yeah. it, and they're just completely Radically opposite. different body, body styles, yeah, body so, types. Man, it's kind of like when I watch those. It's kind of like um, like you ever heard of the game Mortal Kombat? I have heard of it, yes. Yeah, so it's like this, it was this real violent game, I two thousand because it's like they have weapons and stuff that they can sort of bust out randomly. Mm-hmm. Like this guy named Scorpion, he has his weapon, it's a spear <laughs> with a rope or chain or whatever, and he pulls you and he does his thing. Then there's a guy who can freeze people, you know, and a guy who can, um, I don't know, throw his hat and sh- cut people, I don't mm-hmm. know, you know. So people have all these different weapons, but then you would think, hey, if a guy can freeze a person, wouldn't he be the best guy? You just freeze people. Mm-hmm. That's all you got to do, you know. But it doesn't work itself out. It's whoever's good at using the little ice ray or whatever, whatever it's called. Interesting. You know what Who's better at using that spear with the with the rope? You know okay, we'll go with it, man. But that's that's the way it works in jujitsu too. I'm just saying. Well, anyways, that question relates to the next question. Oh, okay. Which yes, next question. Sure. Yes. Hi, Jocko. Mortal Kombat. <laughs> <laughs> or was, that was it Street good, Fighter? No, what no, no. There's Street Fighter too. Yes. Actually, there's Street Fighter. Which really kind of went unnoticed, I think, by the general public. Then there's Street Fighter Two. That's when it sort of became like this big. That was like the main combat game, I think, with fighting Street Fighter Two. What years was that? I don't know. I was in high school though, so I don't know. Nineties. Okay. It was good. No, I, I was doing jujitsu. Yeah, and uh, well, yeah, man. Well, you missed out a little bit because con- no, there's I didn't a lot miss of out concepts. on anything. Yeah, dude. Street Fighter Two with the, there was this guy named Guile. His name was Guile. Dude. Bro, no. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, revisit that, or in your case, visit that. Guile, he threw this thing called a Sonic. It's, it's, it's long. Just look at it. Anyway, next question. Jocko, there's an army cliche that I'm sure you've heard of, or you've heard that goes, everyone's leadership style is different. I've heard it used many times as a cover-up for a failed mission or with someone who just isn't getting it done. What's your opinion on this? For all the advice that you give, there seems to be a continuous method to your madness and some basic principles for being a good leader. Does everyone have a different leadership style or is there an optimal optimal method with personality tweaks? That's just amazing how well this jujitsu comparison to this is this is this is Translates. just an incredible translation and if you know the way broad, broadly you see it in all things because what this question is is exactly the same as the question above. And and the fact of the matter is, if you know jujitsu, Brazilian jujitsu, yeah. you know the fundamental principles of it. You can do these tweaks. If you don't know the fundamental principles of it, you're just going to get destroyed. Yeah. Now, okay, if you're a catch wrestler, that the, those have the same sort of fundamental things going on. You know what I mean? If you know sambo, so if you know judo, so I'm saying if you understand, I, I don't know what to call them, but if you understand like the fundamental principles of submission grappling of any kind, yeah. if you know what those are, then you can make some tweaks to them. You can make th- some some adjustments to them to ba- based on your style and your body type and your personality and your strengths and weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is the same thing with leadership. So people are gonna have different styles. 
they're gonna have different styles of leadership. Some people are super char- charismatic, right? And that person could take advantage of their, their charisma. Some mm. people like connect with other people really easily, some people don't. You're gonna have just different f- little nuances to your personality and your brain mm. that are going to, that you're gonna make little adaptations in your leadership style, that's okay. Where it gets not okay is if you leave the fundamental principles. That's where you have a problem. There was a, there's a, an example that I thought of when I read this question. There was a guy that was coming through my training when I was running the, uh, the advanced training for the SEALs. And he was making, and actually Leif's told story. You, you remember Leif, he's told the story, I think it's in the book too. I don't remember, but it's it's podcast, book. We've talked about it a bunch. We talk about it when we to go talk to clients. Leif tells this story about how he was trying to give commands over the radio yeah. and no one's doing anything yeah. because it's ineffective to give commands in the radio in a when there's a lot of machine gun fire and all this stuff going on. So I said, hey, Leif, use verbal commands. And he kind of like looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, hey, man, just give it a try. He did it. It worked. A couple years later, I'm running training, and there's a guy that's given a bunch of commands on the radio. And I go to him, I go, hey, man, use verbal commands. And he's like, he's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, yell at everyone so they know what it is you want them to do. Mm. They can't hear you on the radio. There's a lot of stuff going on. And he goes, I don't lead that way. That's what he said to me. I don't lead that way. And, you know, they just got destroyed. Because, you know, in his, I don't know if he thought like, hey, look, I'm not going to yell. I wasn't telling him to yell at his people. Mm. I was telling him like, yell the verbal commands. And he wouldn't do it. And they just got annihilated all the time. Mm. And he ended up not doing well as a leader. Because he was breaking the fundamental principles of combat leadership. Like simple, clear, concise commands that everyone understands. And if they don't understand it, whose fault is it? It's yours. Mm. And if you're talking on the radio, giving these complex orders, people aren't going to understand what to do. But if you give them the the, the standard operating procedure maneuver command, mm. peel right, that's going to get passed and everyone's going to do it. <laughs> so he strayed away from the fundamental principles. It's like It's like saying, well, you know, with me, if I give you if I use a pressure point on your neck, yeah. then I'll win. It's like, no, actually, that's not going to be effective. Yeah. You, the, the pressure point thing is a fantasy. Yeah. Oh, no, it's real. Oh, okay, th- it is real. You know what? And there's, a, there's certain parts of your body that hurt a little bit more when you press into them. I understand that. Yeah. That doesn't change you from getting choked. It yeah. doesn't change you from getting double leg takedown. You try and hit someone with a pressure point while they're doing a double leg takedown on you, you're not going to make it. No, it's not going to happen. So, um, you 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 have, and I've told this story too about the guy that wasn't very loud, and I told him like, "Hey, you got to get louder." And eventually, he got the guys that were loud in his platoon to start giving the verbal commands because he wasn't loud enough to do it, hmm. and that was an effective way. Still using the same principle, just using a little bit of a different technique. Hmm. That's fine. So, yes, different leaders are going to lead differently, but the principles are going to remain the same. The the principles of ownership, cover and move, simple, prioritize and execute, decentralized command, and balancing the dichotomies. And then there's plenty of them in leadership. The good leaders out there, they will follow those principles and they'll make little tweaks to them based on their personality and that's fine. But a tweak doesn't require an excuse. Mm. (laughs) And also effective or ineffective. Like if you make a change, if you do something a certain way and it's not effective, then whatever you change isn't working. Mm. It's not working. So use the fundamental principles, make little adaptations, it's okay. But if a leader is ineffective and they're failing, guess what? Their little adaptations, like, hey, I could make up a new move, right? Yeah. For jujitsu. And I and I call it the 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 whiz bang. Sure. And whiz I say, bang. hey, I made up this cool move. It's called the whiz bang. And let me show it to you. And so I show it to you. And you're like, well, I don't know if that'll work or not. And I'm like, no, it'll definitely work. The cool thing about jujitsu is <laughs> when I try it, we find out if it works. Right. Now, something doesn't work immediately. Yeah. Right, but let's say I keep drilling it on you and drilling it on you, and I can never get you in the whiz bang. Okay, and then I go in a tournament, and I try the whiz bang, and I get smashed and defeated. And then I, I go through the constellation bracket, I try the whiz bang, and it gets smashed and defeated. Then I go in the next tournament, I try the whiz bang, and it gets smashed and defeated. 
Then I get in the constellation bracket. I, I try the whiz bang. I get smashed and defeated. And I do this for six months. And the whiz bang never works. Effective or ineffective? Currently ineffective. <laughs> it's ineffective. Yeah. It's ineffective. If you're in a leadership position or someone's in a leadership position and they're failing and they're failing to execute the mission over and over and over again, their little tweak, their little leadership thing that they think is good to go, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not good to go. And it probably, in fact, I'll tell you, it violates one of the fundamental principles of combat leadership. And if you can identify which one of those things it's violating, you can get them to clean it up and fix it. Yeah. Makes sense. So there you go, whiz bang, don't try it. Don't try the whiz bang. I don't know though. I mean, these jujitsu moves. You know how like guys will like bust out moves. Man, I don't know. It's a, it's this endless thing with yes. jujitsu no, moves. New moves come out. Yeah, and and, then, and you won't hit a move a hundred percent of the time, and yeah. you definitely won't hit it when you first start doing it. It's gonna be hard. Yeah. It, how many arm locks do you think you put on someone before you made someone tap? Yeah. In the beginning, you probably did fifty arm locks before you got someone to tap. Yeah, probably more. Yeah. Yeah, maybe even more. Yeah. So that doesn't mean what the, after the first 49 oh, it's ineffective. I'm not gonna do it Yeah, the, th the, di the big difference is the big mm -hmm. difference is an arm lock is a proven known entity yeah. Cover and move is a proven known entity yeah. simple is a proven known entity Prioritize yeah. and execute is a proven known entity yeah. Extreme ownership is a proven known and decentralized command is a proven. It's like an arm lock. It's like a choke That's yeah. why when some people say to me. Oh, well my boss doesn't like extreme ownership. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know what's happening. Like, it's their, the boss's ego is offended because there's some other, some, somebody telling them a different way to lead. No, it's like, what do you believe in? I don't believe in extreme ownership. Oh, I blame and I believe in placing the blame on other people. That's how I lead. Yeah. That's complete, re completely ridiculous. Everybody knows that's ridiculous. Yeah. It's completely ridiculous. Cover and move. I don't believe in cover and move. Oh, so you just like your other team members to go and take care of themselves and you take care of yourself. How does that work? Don't work. It doesn't either. work. Yeah. Keep the, oh, I don't like to keep things simple. No, I like to make things so compli complicated that people don't understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Does that make any sense whatsoever? No, it doesn't. Yeah. Prioritize and execute. No, don't do that. What, I sh what I'm going to do is spread myself so thin that I don't have the assets or resources to actually accomplish anything. That's what I'm going to do because that yeah. makes sense because I don't believe in extreme ownership or those yeah. fundamental laws of combat leadership. Yeah. That's where you're at. Decentralized command. Oh, I don't believe in that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make every single decision myself from yeah. the headquarters position. When you guys want to make a decision out there on the battlefield or out there on the, on the manufacturing floor, I want you to run every single de decision up through me because that's going to be effective. Yeah. So if you violate one of these principles, you're, you're going to have problems as a leader. If you tweak these principles, that's fine. If you look at decentralized command and you're like, you know what? I know that the normal kind of span of control is five people. I can handle more than that. I can handle nine. And you step it up. That's, that's a tweak. That's mm -hmm. okay. Right? That's fine. If you pri When you prioritize and execute, hey, the way I prioritize and execute, and this is the truth, <clears throat> the way I prioritize and execute isn't I look at my number one problem and I only focus on that one. I assign somebody to my number one problem. Mm -hmm. And I say, hey, Bill, Go handle that room over there. It's a problem. Mm. And then I look at Mike and say, hey, Mike, get the rest of this hallway cleared. So I'm actually handling two things, but I give Bill the priority. priority. So yeah. that's a tweak. I'm using assets. That's mm. fine. So sometimes, yes, you got to make these little adjustments. Everyone's got a different leadership style, but you don't violate the principles of leadership. Just like you don't violate the principles of submission grappling, I'll call it. Yeah. Dig it. Next <sighs> question. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and I'd like your advice. When I was younger, I joined the National Guard in an attempt to do something with my life and get out of depression. I lost my discipline and goals after basic training and continued in depression and disorganization. I had the opportunity to go to fight to flight school, but instead tested positive on a drug test and I was given a general discharge. I, of course, take full responsibility and feel like an idiot. How would you recommend moving past this failure? 
what would you have done if your SEAL career ended with a mistake? Well, if my SEAL career had ended with a mistake, I would have figured out what my next mission was going to be. That's that's what I would have done. I mean, I would have said, okay, I like that job. I failed at it. What can I learn from that? And what can I do next differently to make sure I don't make that mistake again? Mm-hmm. I'm going to learn from the past, but I'm not going to dwell on it. Mm-hmm. There's no point in dwelling on it. The only point in dwelling on it is to learn from it. So, so that's what I would do here. And then I would take what I learned from my experiences of where I failed and I would also take the positive things that I learned because you, even that, even that failure is a positive. Even that failure is a positive because you realize, you realize the value of the opportunity that you had and you blew it and you're like, okay, I'm never gonna let that happen again. Lesson learned. <laughs> I'm ha- actually stoked I get to learn that lesson because there's gonna be more opportunities that come up in life mm-hmm. and you gotta make sure that you don't disregard those opportunities when they come up. And I, so I would have taken those lessons learned, take that, take that failure and turn it into something positive and made good things happen when I figured out what my new mission and new career was going to be. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. You can you can do so much good. And you know, that's going back to the story that I told about uh, Jeff in the beginning of this podcast. One of the wording, some of the wording that I struggled with in the kid's story, and again, it's on it's the Warrior Kid podcast, one of the things that I struggled with in telling the story was I ended up saying Jeff had gone too far and he couldn't correct himself. Yeah, He had gone too far and he couldn't come back. And that's a real hard thing to tell a person and it's a real hard thing to tell a kid. And the, the reason why I left it that way, the reason why I kept it like, listen, you can make mistakes that you can't come back from, especially as a kid. You can make mistakes that you can't come back from. They're pretty rare, right? Mm-hmm. There's not too many mistakes that are so grievous that you can't recover from them. Mm-hmm. Like this guy. Hey, man, he made a mistake. He failed a drug test, given a general discharge. That sucks. Mm-hmm. Guess what? He can do all kinds of good in the world. He can make up for that tenfold. He can start a business, make money, he can create a family, he can raise great kids, and there's so many things that he can make sure his kids understand that and know that and learn from it. And he can make sure some other neighborhood kids and high school kids and grade school kids, he can make such an impact on the world by learning from that mistake. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's a harsh thing to say like, hey, there's some things you can't. Now, what this guy can't recover from and this is what the, this is the f- uh, fact that you have to face. And this is why I told it this way in the kid's story. Mm. He didn't understand. When he made that mistake, he didn't understand that there's some mistakes you cannot recover from. He can't be a pilot now. Mm. It's not going to happen. Zero chance of him being a military pilot. That's the way it works. So if I would have had the opportunity to tell him when he was 13 years old, hey, listen, bro. I get it, you're gonna step outside the box sometimes, but there's some mistakes that you can make that you'll never be able to recover from, so think about what you're doing before you do them. You need to think about what you're doing before you do them. And if I would've had the opportunity to tell him that when he was 13 years old, he might've had a better decision-making process when he got older. That's why I left it that way for those kids, so that they recognize that there are some things that you do as as a person, as a kid, that you cannot recover from. You cannot recover from them. Now, that being said, when you take this and you put it in perspective as an adult, see, and as an adult, you have a much broader world to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And just because he's not going to be a pilot, a military pilot, by the way, just because he's not going to be a military pilot, there's all kinds of other opportunities out there. And you can explain that to an adult, but it's hard to explain that to a kid. Mm -hmm. So what other opportunities? I mean, even if, especially like, oh, you want to be a pilot? Cool, you can become a civilian pilot. And you can, you know, you can fly. You can make things happen that way. But what we're not going to do and what I would not do is dwell on the past and dwell on what the the big missed opportunity is because guess what? That's that's a missed opportunity that there's all kinds of people in the world would love for that to be their biggest mistake that they've made. That's that's it. They Mm -hmm. would love. There's someone sitting in prison right now. That's like, man, I wish all I did was get a fail a drug test and I could have learned my lesson. Instead, I'm sitting here in prison. 
or I got injured really bad because I did something that I shouldn't have done or I made a bad decision or I got someone that I care about hurt or injured because I took them in a, in a car when I was drunk. Like those are the kind of mistake. This mistake, sure, it's a bummer. Guess what? There are infinitely, infinitely worse mistakes that he could have made. Infinitely worse. Mm. So you're all right, man. You're okay. Learn from it. Don't dwell on it. Move on and go go do something really positive in the world. Yeah. Next question. Hey, Jocko. What can we do with a coworker who isn't on board? When someone brings up something to him, he gets defensive and turns it into being everyone else's problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> This was a Twitter question, by the way, sure. and uh, and I answered it, and I answered it really simply, really straightforward. Take ownership of the problem and solve it. Take ownership of the problem and fix it. Yeah. Right. Because think about what's happening here, right? The, what the person is saying, like, oh, this is me saying, oh, Echo won't take ownership of the problem, and every time I tell him he does something wrong, he just gets defensive. Right. So, I'll, I'll, I mean, obviously, I'm not communicating with you well enough. If all I'm doing is blaming you and you're getting defensive, and by the way, if I'm the type of person that takes ownership of things, why am I blaming you in the first place? I should be looking at myself. I should be looking at myself. And by the way, if Echo, if you point your fingers at me and you say, hey, this is my fault, you know what I say? Yeah, I agree. It is my fault. And here's what I'm going to do to fix it. <laughs> now, I'm not going to rub it in your face. Mm. I'm not going to do it so I prove a point. That's not what I'm doing. I'm actually doing it because I want to win. I'm actually doing it because I want to accomplish the mission. That's why I'm going to fix the problem. Now, if we have a weak member of the team that doesn't take ownership, then guess what? It's my responsibility to take ownership of the problem and fix it. And eventually, but the good thing about this is if you make an excuse about something and I fix that excuse, and then you make an excuse about something else, I fix that one, and then you make an excuse about something else and I fix that one, eventually there's no more excuses for you. Mm. And now you're left with what you can actually handle as echo with no more excuses to make. And then either you're capable or you're not. And by the way, guess what? As the leader, then it becomes my job to get rid of you if you can't, if you cannot do the thing that I asked you to do or that you're supposed to do for the team. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, because I mean, eventually, if you if if I keep stepping up and taking things away from you, there's not going to be any more excuses, and you'll either end up with no responsibility and therefore no value, and then you have no job. That's the way it works. Now, let me ask you this. When is there a time that a subordinate does something and it's not the leader's fault? So, so think about this. And when something goes wrong with a team member, when is it not the leader's fault. So if you got a machine gunner and the machine gunner shoots outside of his field of fire, clearly he didn't pay attention during the brief. That's the problem. If I have a machine gunner that engages non-hostile targets, it's the machine gunner's fault because he didn't do improper, he, he did improper positive identification of his targets and engaged f friendlies or or at least non-hostiles. So that's the machine gunner's fault. Or the machine gunner's weapon goes down because the machine gunner didn't clean. It's his fault because he didn't clean his weapon, maintain his weapon properly, the machine gunner's fault. So all those things. The machine gunner shoots out of his field of fire, the machine gunner engages non-hostile targets, the machine gunner's weapon goes down, all those are the machine gunner's fault. Clearly. Or maybe not so clearly because here's how I would look at those things. Because by the way, when I point, if you're my machine gunner and I put my finger at you and start yelling at you and telling you that you did something wrong, obviously we know what happens. You start making excuses and blaming other people and, and you don't accept any responsibility because you get defensive and that's what people do. So for me, and what a good leader does is a good leader, when the machine gunner shoots out of his field of fire, the leader says, oh, you know what? I didn't explain the fields of fire clearly enough for you. I'm sorry, I'll fix it. Machine gunner engages a non-hostile target. 
then the leader says hey I should have given you better training on target identification we will go back and fix that or the machine gunners weapon goes down it means that I hey as the leader you know what I should have done a better job inspecting weapons I should have explained how important the maintenance was that's my fault I won't let it happen again so even in these instances where it's real easy to blame the, the individual a good leader instead of blaming the individual will take ownership of the problem that's what you do and that's what's going on in this case you got a co-worker that's not on board and and just gets defensive and turns it into everyone else's problem that's right grab ownership of those problems and by the way the, the, the subordinate that's not taking ownership that's your fault as a leader and the way that you get someone to take ownership isn't by saying hey don't get defensive you need to take ownership of this problem it's your problem that doesn't make people take ownership here's the tricky part here's the black belt situation the black belt situation is if I want you to take ownership instead of blaming you I'm gonna take I'm gonna take ownership of the problem I'm gonna relieve you of that and now you're gonna go wait, wait, no 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 wait, that, 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 no I should be able to fix that mm. I'm sorry boss I'm mm-hmm. sorry Jocko I should have shot my I shouldn't have shot outside the field of fire I need to pay better attention during the brief if I don't know what it was I'm gonna ask questions next time are you sure yes I'm sure please let me get it fixed mm. and that is how you get someone to take ownership you don't get people to take ownership by telling them to take ownership of things yeah. and there's a little dichotomy here too because if it's a plan then the way I get you to take ownership of it is by saying hey echo come up with a plan like we talked about the standard operating procedures earlier if I come up with the standard operating mer- procedures myself and then I force them onto you mm. you don't take ownership of those yeah. those are mine so I have to give you ownership, but when it's a negative, so when it's a positive thing, I give it to you. When it's a negative thing, I take it. Mm. I take it. Positive thing, give it. Because people want that positive thing. Yeah. When it's a negative thing, they don't want it, you take it from them. Right. And by the way, when it's a positive thing and you give it to them, guess what they want to do with it? They want to share it. They want to yeah. do it. Yeah. When it's a negative thing and you force it on them, they want to get rid of it. So, there you go. I'm glad that this person's in the game and now they know how to handle this coworker and make it into a good situation. I think we got time for one more. Last question. Jocko. Hey, Jocko. How do you implement change when you know it is needed? How do you implement change when you know what is needed? Well, when I know I need to change something, uh, what I do is I change it. That's what I do. I change it. And I've had people that listen to the podcast and they've reached out to me over the past few years and one of the main messages that they took and put into action was actually putting things into action whatever that was they they stopped eating sugar they stopped sleeping in they they started waking up early they they quit playing video games for 10 or 12 or 14 hours a day they sold that Xbox thing there was a guy that bit his nails for his whole life and he's in his like 30s and what well, whatever no big deals right you know he bit his nails well you know what his nails are all chewed up and they're bloody and they're gross looking and he's self-conscious when he's meeting people and shaking hands and he can't keep his hands away from his mouth while he's in meetings or in in interacting with people but he couldn't stop and then he stopped he just stopped and the list goes on there's people that have quit drinking and quit doing drugs and quit losing their temper and I've heard from so many different people that have implemented change in their lives so so many letters and messages and notes and I want you to know that these people aren't a bunch of 
of elite special operations warriors. That's not who who they are. They aren't a bunch of high level athletes or highly screened and highly trained individuals. These are just just normal people, really. But they're normal people that knew they needed to make a change. And they decided they were going to make a change and then they made it. And that is what I do. And that is what you can do too. If you have something to change, if you want to change something, change it. Change it now. And I think that's all I've got for tonight. So, Echo, speaking of implementing change and change in our lives to become a little bit better, maybe you could help us with some things that can make us a sure. little bit better. Sure. First, what's up with Mikey and the Dragons? Mikey and the Dragons, yes. So, Mikey and the Dragons is released into the world. <laughs> now, okay, so speaking of ownership, and I know the one of the earlier questions was about ownership, and I have to take ownership myself at this time uh-huh. because I made a mistake. I made a mistake. And just as I, as you pointed out, as I've talked about my publisher not ordering enough books and how, hey, they don't order enough books, they don't get it. Well, guess what? I didn't order enough books. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I am getting them printed right now. I'm getting them printed as fast as humanly possible. Um, we have multiple printers working. And if you order early, you're likely going to get yours on the release date. And I know some people have been posting their Amazon uh, images that their Mikey and the Dragons is shipping. So mm. some people are going to get it soon. Uh, but even that's not a guarantee at this point. Even if you ordered early, I apologize. Don't blame Amazon. It's not their fault. Don't blame FedEx and don't blame the post office and don't blame UPS. It's not their fault. If you don't get the book on time, it is one person's fault, and that is mine. I should have done a much better job of estimating how many books you all were going to buy. And I guess as soon as I saw people that were ordering 12 books, 12 Mikey and the Dragons, that should have been a real indicator that I that I should have gotten more printed. But I didn't do that. I apologize. Um, you guys have ordered a ton. And so at this point, I have a ton more being printed. My goal is to get them to you by Christmas. It should be possible. If you order now... We've got enough coming in. They should be there to get in the stockings for Christmas. Mm-hmm. If if you've already ordered, so if you've ordered though, be patient. Um, if you haven't ordered yet, order like right now so that I can print more. And like I said, right now we should have enough. If you order right now, we, you, you should be able to get it by Christmas. Um, and if you want it, yeah, just order it, and I'll just get as many printed as we need. I apologize. It's it's definitely my fault. I was weak. I was... You weren't weak. No, it was I used to call it weak, and then you'd be like, they're just being conservative. Yes, so conservative. I was too conservative. I balanced it too much in the wrong direction, and so order the book. It, it, and I appreciate of the few people that I've sent a copy to. The feedback has been awesome. Um the book in in the words of John Bozak who did the drawing and did the art and you're gonna see he's the same guy that did the the art for way the warrior kid this art is a totally different deal because it's beautiful it's color it's vibrant it's just vibrant yeah he did an amazing job um, and you know what he he says like he's you know he said to me he's like the, and you know people say things and they say it in a certain way yeah he did that he just goes this book is special 
and I was like, you know, the way he said it yeah, was yeah, like, yeah, I was did, like, yeah. and and I feel that way, but you know, of course, I'm biased because I wrote it, right, right. But when when he drew it, so he's biased too. True. But he didn't say it like, hey, this book is awesome. Normal voice, right? He was like, he was like, hey, this book is this book is really special. Yeah. And I was like, okay, so. I think this book is gonna be on every kid's bookshelf. I think it's gonna be right next to their copy of Where the Wild Things Are. Sure. That's what I think, which was you know one of all of our you know, favorite book when you were a kid. And I know that's a bold statement, but anyways, I think it's gonna have a great impact on kids. So if you want a, a copy for your kids, for your neighbor kids, for your library, your school, whatever, classrooms, um, for yourself, for yourself, yes, if you're 38 years old. Yeah, sure. And you want to learn a little something about the world, about overcoming fear, about how to face things, and you want to have it put in a in such a, a clear way, then get yourself a copy. So, right, Echo? Agree. And you've read it, I mean, obviously. Yes, sir, I have. And you've read it to your youngsters? Yes, I have. And they're approved? Approved, yeah. She wants me to read it again. <laughs> like, dang. Well, this one, this is a book that takes... 20 minutes to read yeah, maybe 20 maybe yeah, but around 20 minutes to read yeah, so It rhymes yeah, which is is fun. Yes, and impactful and little kids They love it when those things rhyme. Yeah. Yeah, they it's like fun. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they follow it So there you go if you want one again I apologize if you're not if you don't get it on the 15th of November my goal is to at a minimum some of you are going to get it on the 50. If you ordered early, hopefully you'll get it by then. But my goal, let's get it to you by Christmas. I've got publishers all over, or printers all over printing it. So thank you. And that's that. Mikey and the Dragons. Order cool. it quick. Uh, what else, Echo? Good. What else do we need? Well. How else can we can we implement change in our life? Sure. Well, a lot of jujitsu talk today. Once you know mm-hmm. the way broadly, mm-hmm. you will, in mm-hmm. fact... See, See it, it in, in all, all things. things. So, when you are exploring the road of jujitsu, you're gonna need a gi. Mm-hmm. Even if you do just no gi, well, if you don't, if you only do no gi, then I guess you don't need a gi. But when you are searching for a gi, get an origin gi. That's it, hundred yep. percent. Um, go to originmain.com. That's where you get it. Rash guards on there as well. All Woven. made in America. Woven in America. In America. Cotton. All the cotton. Grown. Grown in America. In America. Yeah. Woven in America. By the way, it's not just cotton. Yeah. It's a special blend. Yeah, and a special weave, by and the way. And a special weave. How cool is that <laughs> weave? Like, no, like, no <laughs> kidding. When you see dragon weave for the first time, yeah. are you not like a little bit... A little bit what impressed? Yeah, I'm yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, bit yeah. impressed. <laughs> so, and here's the thing, too. When you when you kind of been in the game for a long time, yeah. let's say... You're you not can, easily impressed by geese. No. Yeah, well, no, yeah, no, not not g- generally speaking, no. But you do pay attention, like you know, when you grab a gi, mm-hmm. your own gi, you're real used to your mm-hmm. own gi. If you have two gis, three gis, four gis, and mm-hmm. they're all kind of different weaves, you know those, right? Mm-hmm. So when you see someone else with a gi, you grab it, you're like, okay, you know, I'm familiar, mm-hmm. yeah, whatever, cool. But when you j- grab the dragon weed for the first time, especially <laughs> when you've been in the game for a while, yeah. you're like, ooh, this one is different. Well, I like that. You yeah. Know? Well, I've definitely had a couple people that only got into jujitsu, like they've only Dave Burke. Good deal, dude. Yeah, he's only had origin geese. That's oh, he's, it. He's spoiled. Just, he's spoiled. Yeah, he doesn't even know yeah. what all these other stories about bad geese. He doesn't even understand <laughs> them. Stories like, yeah. oh, oh, they just yeah, they they stink and they're heavy and all they rip and all that yeah. stuff. He doesn't know any about any of that. Yeah. He's just like, oh, everything is awesome. <laughs> yeah. So in a way, I mean, I kind of want to say, hey, dang, that's good for him. He's lucky in that way, but. No, you know, hey, that's part of the game. It's part of the journey. Yeah. You know, nonetheless, whether you're used to it or not used to it, Dragon Weave is legit. Are we allowed to talk about that new weave that we were exploring the other day at your house? Uh, not yet. Okay. But we do right. have. Well, we're gonna keep our uh, beaks buttoned on yeah, that one. Yeah. Don't, don't forget about rash guards, though. Yes, of course. So when you're doing no gi, some people they use the t-shirt. I dig it. Some people they use the dry fit. Mm-hmm. I dig it. To me, rash guard is the way to go. Mm-hmm. This is why. Because other people's toes, sometimes, not all the time, mm-hmm. could get caught in that shirt when it's flapping around in the wind. But, True. And, you know, hey, you know, it's a rash guard. It's cool. It looks more uniform What about the scientific compression increased? Uh, 
Yeah. Vascularity. Oh, I'm just kidding. Vas- yeah. No, <laughs> hey, man. I'm no, sure there is there, that. There is that. Yeah. Like, oh, when you when you wear the rash guard. It, yeah. When you wear the compression clothing. Yeah, like health with endurance <laughs> or something. Like, and that's cool. But I'm not over here making those claims. Yeah. I am making this claim. 19% improvement when you yes, wear the rash guard. Based make. on your whole mental state. Yes. Agree. Get some. <laughs> yeah. And not to mention, speaking of mental state, on those days that you don't want to train, get a new rash guard. Those days, they don't exist, they don't anymore. exist anymore. At least for four months. Yeah. Then you need yeah, another new months. rash guard. <laughs> <laughs> she don't give or take. It's true. So, yeah, cool. The compression. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Pete was actually starting to go into it with me. Hey, man, I could tell you. I'm like, well, no, cool, man. Let no, me go no. ahead and call you we, back. We just go 19% improvement 19%. based on mental state. Yeah. Based on getting yeah. after it harder. Yes. Agree. So, yeah, some good rash guards on there. Also, some, uh, how should I say, lounge gear. Actually, oh, I shouldn't come say lounge on, gear. Man. That's, that violates your whole thing. That violates everything. Yeah. Lounge. Anyway. So That's the luxury. You look. can call them luxury items. Get, luxury. We'll get Theo Vaughn here to talk about luxury. Oh, just the concept of luxury. luxury. Yeah, yeah. Luxury days. Well, the sweats that they have are luxury. And here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Unprompted, I go on Twitter, and, you know, you get, like, people when they get their stuff, they're like, hey, you know, you take a picture of your stuff. Mm -hmm. It's normal. So the guy will have a hoodie, and he'll say, this is the softest hoodie I ever had. Straight up. That's the, that is the fact. Yeah. Yeah. That is the fact. And then there's, I didn't understand this, joggers. Yes. I didn't understand why they're called joggers and what their purpose is. Yeah. Old school sweatpants. Yeah. They're just, there's like an elastic, they're like straight cut, then there's an elastic thing around the bottom yeah, and they're cut. just all baggy. Sure. The purpose apparently, did you tell me this, that joggers are cut tighter and then they have like a tighter ankle so you can actually jog in them. That's the purpose. Yeah, yeah so the. Br- I didn't know that. I had no idea. Yeah, so when you jog, they don't flap around in the wind. Though it's not just ankles, the whole leg. So the whole leg kind of adheres to your. It's more like fitted to your leg, mm-hmm. and then they're more roomy in the hips, so you can have a. You know, you can sprint, you can jog, you can run. You see what I'm saying? They just so happen, and that mobility that it allows for running translates hundred and ten percent. To just cruising <laughs> when you're laying down on the, I'm telling you, 100. percent Take it from me, I know. Jack, I cruise hey, a lot. there's uh, some supplements on there too. We cool. got some. We we got some supplements. As a matter of fact, good supplements. Um, Joint Warfare, number one bestseller. Dude. Joint Warfare. I see why. Yeah, uh, krill oil. Yeah. What? Okay, so a lot of people ask this too, and. You told okay, the difference, you know how the people, so a guy would be like, hey, I, I work a physical job, mm-hmm. eight hours, 10 hours a day. I want to mm-hmm. do a workout or whatever. My joints take kind of a beating. Mm-hmm. What should I take? Joint warfare or krill oil? So people, they will wonder about that. Which one should I take? Because they're both for your joint. Yeah. And the, the straight up answer is yes, take both of them. Mm-hmm. You should absolutely take both of them. If you can only get one, mm-hmm. if you, I would say if you're just, if you're just feeling, um, What's the word? Like if you have like legitimate soreness, real legit soreness, I would go with joint warfare. But I like krill oil. And I've, the thing is I've taken the, these things for so long together that I just, I don't know, it's hard for me to answer that. Yeah. But yeah. Well, Brian would tell me that uh, krill oil is for just general, you know, maintenance. Yeah. You know, you're getting, let's face it, you're getting older. And you Negative. know you gotta maintain. You gotta maintain. That's why I'm not getting older. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Get and that yeah, all together. And yeah, like how you were saying, you know, you, you, your joints take a beating, like an actual beating, where mm-hmm. they kind of hurt now. Then yeah, joint warfare because they help inflammation. Well, actually, the krill oil take. Helps I got fi- I, too. I got fired up today. I did my workout. I, I threw on the weight vest. Oh yeah, and I just did. I just pretended like I didn't have it on, but I had it on yeah, for my sure. workout. Right, you know that helps. You know, like oh, that, for that sure. mental state to be like. For sure. So it's a difference between like, like, this is, it, you can lift in these different ways too. But yeah, when you put weights on you, just like you know, some people they'll I don't know, swing a baseball bat or something. They'll put a weight on there or something like that. And mentally, if you basically you're training your functionality with that, re- yeah. and that resistance sort of just happens to be there. So your brain just kind of accommodates. You know, so when you function without the weights, you're just flying around. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. easiest, like I weigh less now, mm-hmm. you know, rather than, oh, I'm going to just eke out 10 reps of this very specific thing. Then you're training your body. Yeah, to I kind of did this. Reps. I kind of did this little like mental debate like, oh, well, I, you know, I feel like I should 
I should do something a little bit more. Oh, maybe I'll do some rounds with this and then I'll take it. And I was like, no, I'm just going to do the whole thing. Like I just, and I did every exercise, yeah, yeah. even just completely unrelated exercises yeah. with with a weight vest on. Yeah, man, that's good. I was doing box jumps the other day, which oh, I actually yeah, yeah, don't yeah, do yeah. that much, oh, okay. but like I did. And I was like, man, I think here's I want the to warning on box weight. jumps. Pay attention during box jumps. Oh, yeah. You, it's real easy, especially when you get, when you get smoked and yeah. you start just kind of, you're just going through the motions. Yeah. And that's when you miss. Yeah. And when you miss the box jump, you get that shinner. No fun. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want none yeah, of that. Yeah. No, and and yes. And that's what I was thinking too. I was like, man, when I, because I, you know, this is part of the Metcon. I was going back and forth. Yeah. Doing, it's a long thing, but box jump was part of it. And yes, towards those later rounds, I was like, okay, I better pay attention. Good. Yeah. And I was doing. I was adding a little something. You know, when you when you jump down, I, I went down into like a little squat. Then did the jump. Oh, I'm okay. saying so. It's not just the box. It's like down squat. Boom. Anyway, but yes, um, and made me think like how I could get a weight vest and really maximize these bo- box jumps. Yeah, That's pay attention. Do. Pay uh, attention. Though, take course. some discipline beforehand too. By the way, which is a little pre-mission. Get some, and then if you need food, if you need nutrients yes. for your body and for your mind, then take milk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> milk. milk tastes delicious. You know what I did yesterday? Sure. What I took whipping cream, heavy whipping cream, heavy whipping cream, whipping cream yes. that you turn into whipped, whipped cream. Yeah, but normally, what do you put in it? You know how to make whipped cream? Yes. What you do you do? Whip it super hard. But what for else a long do you have time? to do? Add an egg white in it. No, well, no, no. you got to add sugar. Oh, okay. So recently, I read this thing that one of the whipped cream companies came out with like Reese's peanut butter whipped cream okay, and some other kind of whipped cream. So you get it in a spray can, yeah. you press the little nozzle, sure. boom, Yeah, you got Reese's peanut butter flavored whipped cream. And I thought to myself, yup, that sounds good, <laughs> boy. That's the freedom part. So guess what I did? Yeah. I took heavy whipping cream that you make whipped cream with mm-hmm. and I put peanut butter milk in it and I whipped it and guess what voila <laughs> <laughs> it is good to go people like you got creating yourself things, some just tastiness yeah tastiness so yeah uh, and all of them taste great all of them are awesome for you and we got mint peanut butter we got mint chocolate peanut butter chocolate vanilla gorilla and of course the darkness chocolate and then warrior kid Warrior Kid Milk, yeah. of which, look, they both taste delicious. As a matter of fact, my son today, because it was getting cold, and I hate saying that, because we're in the, California, yeah. and yeah. cold <laughs> is not cold. So everyone in yeah. Michigan, everyone, Pete, the crew up in Maine, <laughs> I apologize, because it was getting cold this morning, which meant it was yeah. probably like 54, Yeah, right? Which, right. out here in California, in Southern California, it's like, oh, it was cold this morning. So anyways, it was a little chilly this morning, a little nip in the air. Of course, we're only wearing shorts and a t-shirt. So sure. in Maine, I know Pete's up there wearing a parka. <laughs> but my son, he was jumping on his bike to go check the waves, and um, he had a little, he had a little like a coffee uh, tumbler, one of our tumblers. Yeah, yeah. And he doesn't drink coffee, and I was kinda like, what, what are you doing? He goes, I made some hot cocoa milk. <laughs> And I said, let me try it. With the warrior kid on? The warrior kid yeah, chocolate. Yeah, that makes and sense. Bro, it's just it's delicious. Nice. It's yeah. just amazing. It's like hot cocoa. Yeah, it's hot cocoa. Except for guess what? It's good for you and makes you strong. Yeah. Dang, What's up good. with that? It's good. What's up with that? So, mm-hmm. yeah, so that's the milk. Anyways, a strawberry is delicious. It's, get it for your kids. It's In my house, it seems to be the only thing anyone in my house is eating right now. So give that a shot and enjoy it. You're going to be, Matt, I think you might be. What's a parka? A parka is just a coat. It's a like big a thick, winter heavy. coat. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, you ever seen the coat that has like a fur around the hood? Yes, that's yeah. sort of like the okay. quintessential parka. parka. Dang, I think those things are kind of dope. The word parka is kind of kind of iffy. I what think. are you talking about? I don't know. I've never heard the word. Uh, I'm saying well, coming in fresh. You, you're used. You're used to it, bro. You're, you're from Hawaii. How are you gonna know what a parka is? I understand. Didn't that. you not even see snow until like three weeks ago or something? <laughs> No, for real, you didn't see snow until you were 30, right? Or uh, something like well, that? Well, technically, I saw snow on the Big Island when I was a little kid one time. Yeah. And you go to the Big Island, you go up in Mauna Kea, and it, you can see snow. We went up there with shorts and a tank top, by the way. Mm-hmm. We just drove up there. 
But since then, yes, I had not seen snow until I was 30. Yes. Yeah. yeah so you, there's no possible way you're going to know what a park is, yeah. bro. So, yeah. So which this kind of is part of my happening. point where if you've never really, I mean, I've heard the word parka, but I, I'm not used to what a parka <laughs> kind of entails and the and what the goodness of that. So I'm just left with the word parka. Yeah. And a parka, is, as far as just the word, doesn't seem like, a, I don't know, seems like a funny word. Huh. Well, put some context around it. Yeah. Freezing cold people, give them a parka. Nice, Get solid, warm, warm yeah. functional live, parka. Be able to live. Yeah. Yep. I Man, I dig it. See? Uh, growing. You know, growth. We call that growth. I'm growing here. I'm trying Thank to. Goodness. Speaking of growth, you want to stay on the path and represent at the same time. Grow in that way. Go to jockostore.com. That's right. Jocko is a store. That's where you can get your discipline equals freedom shirts. Women. Tank tops, by the way. Mm. Work out. Men tank tops? Men's tank tops. I know the temperature is dropping. I'm not going to say it's cold here in California. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. The temperature is lowering, you know? Uh. So I dig it if you're not going to wear the tank top all the time. I dig it. But they're on there nonetheless. Uh, some hoodies. Mm-hmm. Either they're out now or they will be within one week from right now. T shirts? T-shirts. How about sure. that Defcore T-shirt? Defcore T-shirt. Oh, all of day. See, you're representing the Defcore T-shirt right now. It's <laughs> good because it's. Hey, I talked about like, for me. To make a statement with what you're wearing is kind of just a little bit. I don't like that. It's too much. I'm not dressing to make a statement. Is yeah. my is my point? Yeah. I don't think. Oh, I'm not dressing to make a statement. I wear the functionality is primary. Sure. So. I don't know. I thought this shirt is functional. Right. It is functional. And it makes a subtle statement, I must admit. Well, even there not a making su- a statement is making a statement. Yeah. It's kind of like well, Bruce Lee. Well, yeah, well, no. I, you, if you try too hard to not make a statement, then that's just, yeah, yeah. then you're, you're, the bigger you're, you're defeating it. Yeah, you're defeating the purpose. That's mm-hmm. why this, this shirt, subtle statement made mostly to yourself. It's not a statement to the world because people just look at this and not even think twice about it. Nope. Maybe they think one more time about it and think, what is that? Yeah. Well, Anyways. if you're watching this on YouTube, they're going to notice that you're not wearing the victory, and that's going to make a huge <laughs> statement, and that's going to actually maybe even throw some people for a little uh, loop. And you know, check. nonetheless, yes, all on JockoStore.com. Some cool rash guards on there as well. Some get out a little bit more. How should I say? Geared towards the specific path of getting after. <laughs> well, there's there's, there's technically there. one that literally says get, get after, after it, it. Exactly so i guess right. that's point on point <laughs> yes. uh hey subscribe to the podcast if you don't itunes google play stitcher leave reviews so that we can read them and get a good laugh from the crazy things that you say thank you mm-hmm. also the warrior kid podcast we just put out a new one i apologize that they come a little bit further apart than these uh, I've gotten many people that have said they have been listening to the first 18 Warrior Kid podcasts over and over and over again. So I'm glad that they're learning lessons, and I appreciate the feedback on those. Also, you go, don't forget your Warrior Kid soap from IrishOaksRanch.com. Young by made by young Warrior Kid Aiden, who's making Jocko soap, yeah. and his advice, which I totally agree with is get some soap so you can stay clean. <laughs> Dig it. YouTube, don't forget about YouTube. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can see Echo's legit videos. You can see if we have guests on, you can see who they are, what they look like, how they react, all that stuff. You can get a feel for, you can get to see what, if you don't know what Echo looks like, he doesn't look like what he sounds like, so we've been told. Yeah. So you can see what Echo looks like, and then you can put a comment that says it can say for instance echo looking jacked sure or damn echoes yoked or whatever so there's a lot of those comments that make it on there and i know that that that's basically the form of compensation that echo gets for his work (laughs) is people telling people in youtube comments saying echoes got jacked guns so if you want to if you want to Pay Echo Charles. If you want to pay Echo Charles, there's no Patreon account. <laughs> there's no GoFundMe. You just go onto YouTube comments and you write Echo looking jacked boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so there you go. Clever, clever, clever. Also, Psychological Warfare. That's an album with tracks that we made, Jocko talking, by the way, telling you how to get past 
through, get through, power through those moments of weakness when they arise, which they do sometimes, by the way. I know you don't know this. Actually, you do know this, but they do arise. But if Jock was there telling you how to get through it pragmatically, by the way, you'll get through it. I found that to be a fact 100% of the time. Also, while you're doing your workout and it gets boring, go to onit.com slash Jocko, by the way, and get new kettlebells. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. Totally revives your whole workout. In fact, do this. Do your normal workout. If, in fact, it doesn't have kettlebells in the workout, do your normal workout and do a kettlebell workout. Like maybe like a five or ten minute one. Yeah, my son was asking me about working out and... He was kind of like, oh, I just want to get like, like what big muscles just just get strong. And yeah. so I and he d can do the or has done the kettlebell snatch. Yeah. But I was like up the weight a little bit and throw that thing up there. And it, I go every time you have to stop that thing in the top position. It's a, your whole body has to kind of put yeah. some effort into it. Oh, yeah. You will have if you haven't done it before. And you go a little bit heavier than like what you which I don't, you know, if we could be careful, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, so if you go a little bit heavier, you will have, like, sure. sore abs the oh, next yeah. day. Your abs yeah. will be sore. So your posterior chain sure. will be Bro, that's a real get thing. some work. Why are you going to say it like that? I know, it's <laughs> posterior, your posterior chain, because there's people like, what you want to do? No, yeah. so your posterior chain will be uh, get work. But believe it or not, your front anterior chain, your anterior chain will get work, too, because it has to s arrest. Yes, that weight which is flying up there and then it has to stop otherwise it rips your shoulder out which is why yeah. you should be careful don't go too heavy but it's and so my you know my bicep is is, is healing mm -hmm. it's, it's almost there man we're almost there but mm -hmm. one of the things i could straight up not even start doing till very recently is kettlebells on that side mm -hmm. you know because it flaps around yeah, and yeah, like yeah. it twists it Danger. twists your wrist in this way that it really it puts so even when i go out on a light one and it's weird because the pain is less there more so than just kind of the raw newness of my arm going through that whole kettlebell procedure. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? So like, you know, when the thing comes up to a rest right here on your wrist, mm -hmm. just it sitting there on your wrist, it has to rest there on your wrist. Your wrist is twisted in a certain way, you know? Mm -hmm. and it's cool. It's normal if you don't. But man, it's weird the difference of my right hand, my good hand, and my bad hand. Just the thing resting on the thing is like, oh, you know, like you haven't. So, so you lack the conditioning. Yeah, the conditioning but is faded. Just in your little yeah, yeah, just bone the, the pressure and the yeah, yeah, the toughness, you know, the toughness has of faded. my whole thing. Yeah. I felt that the other day when we were rolling. What? Oh, that my toughness. Yeah, just worn. like a, a dissension of toughness. Yeah, across the yeah, board. no, 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 I didn't <laughs> see. I was, I was just, I was, I was taking it light. You know, see what I'm saying. <laughs> You're really, yeah. you're really happy with that, aren't you? <laughs> you? I'm just saying. Hey, don't forget about Jocko White Tea. It is certified as the only beverage, whether you get it in the can or you get it in the bag and you steep it yourself. Either way, it is the only beverage in the world that comes with a 100% money back guarantee of an 8,000 pound deadlift. Good. Which is really good. And it's organic, by the way. So <laughs> and that's it's something. organic on top of that. <laughs> Something so tasty, and as the winter arrives, and it gets really Super cold, cold out yeah, here in man. California. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. my people <laughs> of the north, uh, you get that warm tea going. Just put a couple bags in. Now, some people worry about how long you should steep. Do you know what steep the tea means? I, I do not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, how long should you steep the tea? In my opinion, when I put a tea bag in, it's not coming out. Oh, straight up! I just yeah. leave it in there. It I'm forever. just gonna, I'm gonna leave it in there. It's, it's good to go to drink in, you know, like a couple, like a minute or yeah. maybe two minutes. But then I'm not taking that tea bag. I'm gonna get all that, all that Jocko white tea, all that, all that pomegranate goodness, all yeah. that, all, all those antioxidants are coming right into my system. <laughs> Solid, bro. and it tastes delicious, and it does have caffeine in it. I will say, so the cans have 60 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Depending on how long you steep, and I think when you steep it like I do, there's probably a little bit extra, a little bit of extra. Get some sure. inside there. <laughs> steep so it forever. That. Also got some books. Okay, Way of the Warrior Kid and Mark's Mission. Those are two kids' books, but I promise you that Uncle Jake has lessons for everyone. Yeah, agree. And I'm one of those people. And uh, so I think when you read that to your kids, oh well, in my case, because. 
My daughter's five. Can't quite read a book mm-hmm. yet. So I'll read it. But I feel like I'm reading to myself too. Mm-hmm. Like these are all things that I, some that you forget. I think as an adult, you forget a lot of these lessons. You know, because now you have a routine. As an yeah. adult, you have a routine. Some of these lessons, it feels like they don't apply at first, you know. Yeah. So you kind of forget them and you go, man, I wish I could just incorporate that little thing. One, back of, into one of the fundamental laws of combat is simple. Yeah. And way the warrior kid is the it's life rules put yeah. forth in a very simple way that a young child could yeah. understand them. But what's surprising is in that simplicity, it hits anyone yeah. solidly yeah. right between the eyes so that's way the warrior kid and mark's mission you can get those also got the discipline equals freedom field manual that's another one that if you if you re or if you refer to it'll Mm -hmm. like remind you because like okay so man i i don't meditate i don't Mm -hmm. like you know like for like Okay, it's arguable. Ooh, jiu-jitsu is meditation. Yeah, it's not. It it's not. It's not meditation. Nah, I know. Okay. I mean, you know what they're talking yeah, about I when know, you say demeditate. Oh, so, <laughs> but from what I understand, if you meditate on certain things, they help like incorporate it yeah. into your, you know, your whole normal thought process. Meditate or whatever. Heel hook over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would start with, by the way. But and then you would need and this is just my my thought about meditation. You would need less reminders of certain things, you know, like yes. how to how to, it like detaches to, uh, for whatever reason. When I understood the the, the concept of detach mm-hmm. and the importance of it, that's an, that's to me just kind of established itself as like pretty one of the most important things that you can roll into your life that'll improve it right it away, definitely like will. right then and there. But here's the thing, just like how you said. You got to notice when you got to detach, you know, it's not detaching isn't the hard part. It's to notice, you know, like when it's time to go. And so for lack of a better term, you're forgetting to detach right now because you're so distracted by how you feel or whatever. So it's one of the, so the fuel manual is like a really good one. So like, man, if you can refer to that, boom. And this goes for all the subjects in there, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like, so like every day, even every other day, two, three days, whatever, just refer back to it. Man, it helps. It keeps it on your mind. All these things. Yeah. Totally does. People post pictures of the field manual yeah like one like one page or two pages yeah. book. and it, when i whenever i when someone posts a picture of that i actually read i wrote the book but i still read this section and say like and and it and i don't read it and go oh i remember writing that i actually yeah. go i can do that better yeah like, i want to do that i need to focus you know what i mean yes. so and yeah. here's a good thing about that where um overwhelmed right that was one that uh, I, I don't even know who posted it first, I think, but yeah. it was like yeah, Sean Front posted it and like JP maybe JP or yeah Andy like, Andy reposted yeah, for it. Sella, yes, so that was one where it's like you know why they're you know why people are posting that because when they read it when they go they refer to it they're like oh it clicked yeah. again let me you know because that's kind of the whole nature yeah. of posting things so the boom that's exactly what's happening so it's like boom I need to remember that one it's not like that's the first time they read it maybe it is yeah. maybe it's not but most of the time it's like okay I referred back to that. And they're gonna repost it, so it's doing exactly what I'm saying. Yep. It's reminding you, like overwhelmed, overwhelmed. And the, the you know certain ones apply to you at certain times too, you know. So it's like good, man, just to refer yep. back to that. That's what I do. It will keep you on the path. If you want the audio version, it's not available on Audible.com. It's available on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play, and other MP3 platforms. Also, Extreme Ownership. I already talked about extreme ownership and the leadership principles that are in that and I talk about them all the time and Explain them to people in every different type of organization That's what everyone at echelon front does which is our leadership consulting business Which is me and Leif Babin and JP Donnell and Dave Burke and Flynn Cochran and Mike Sorelli and Mike Bima That's what we do. We talk about the fundamental principles that are in that book that we brought home from the battlefield and that book extreme ownership after we got done writing that book and taught that stuff we wrote another book it's called the dichotomy of leadership which we also talked about a bunch today because you can't talk about you can't talk about leading human beings without talking about extreme ownership the fundamental principles of the laws of combat and and then when you start talking about that you got to talk about the dichotomy of leadership Mm -hmm. so those two books are also available and what I like seeing is when, like I just saw one today, guy had probably posted a picture of 30 copies. 
mm-hmm. of the dichotomy of leadership. He's like, yeah, this is going to the whole team. Because mm-hmm. that's how you get everyone aligned. You make everyone see, oh, you know what? I'm going to think of this way. Now, some people go, oh, well, I don't want to share the secrets. They want to keep it for themselves. That yeah. doesn't help you. You yeah. don't do better. Yeah. You do better if you if everyone understands the principles. Yeah. That's going to make you do better as the leader. And by the way, if you're out there trying to do better for yourself, don't read the book. Go and do something else because I don't even want you around. Oh, if just for yourself. <laughs> if you're just it, yeah, trying yeah. to look out for you, mm-hmm. the principles aren't for you. Yeah. You won't understand them mm. properly. So, and yet, if you want to win, the best possible way to win, by the way, isn't by looking out for yourself. It's by looking out for the good of the team. It's by looking out for the mission. That's how you win. Yeah. And that's what these books will help you do. So there's those at Echelon Front, I already talked about it, Leadership Consultancy. If you want us to come and work with your company or come and speak to your company, go to echelonfront.com. Don't contact a speaker's bureau. Don't Google Jocko speaking because it'll be a random speaking agent that you'll then have to work through. Just contact us, our company, echelonfront.com. The muster. We have muster seven and eight in 2019 check extremeownership.com those are our leadership conferences and all of them have sold out did i say some of them have sold out nope all of them have sold out and they are all going to continue to sell out so look for the details when the opportunity when when we put the details out and you want to come sign up that's extremeownership.com and then overwatch is our business where we are taking special operations leaders combat aviation leaders and placing them into civilian organizations that need leadership experience and trained leadership so if you want to get involved with that whichever side you're on efoverwatch.com go there and you'll figure out which way to go, whether you're someone from our communities or you're someone that needs leaders from our communities. Go and make that happen. And if you want to stay on the path with us, we are available on the interwebs, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on that visible keyboard. Ha. Uh, Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink and thanks to all the military personnel worldwide worldwide out there in harm's way holding the line and here at home thanks to police and law enforcement and paramedics and EMTs and correctional officers and border patrol and first responders and at this moment actually especially the firefighters out here fighting these crazy and powerful fires in California Thanks to you all. I know there's a lot of uh, police and EMTs and paramedics supporting them as well. Just all of you. Thanks for risking your lives to make us safer. And to the rest of you that are out there carrying on your mission, whatever that may be. But if you're listening, I know you're in the game and trying to get better just like we are. And if there's a change that you need to make in your life, you know what you need to do. Get after it and make that change. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko. Out.